Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants in charge of recording please start their recordings? PC recording started. Thank you. Our recording is good. Thank you. And at this time, will Sergeant Biondo please start with his opening statement? Sure. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearings on the committees of contracts jointly with the Committee on Governmental Operations and the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification? To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices on silent or vibrate mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Chairs, we're ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to this joint hearing between the New York City Council Committee on Contracts, Economic Development and Governmental Operations. Today is Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. My name is Ben Kales. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Contracts. For those of you who are watching remotely, appeals please feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos and my co-chairs will share their Twitter as well. Before we begin, I'd like to extend my thanks to my co-chairs, Council Member Paul, Levo Paul Vallone and Council Member Fernando Cabrera, as well as members of all three committees and Council Member Richie Torres for his sponsorship of proposed introduction 1980A, which we will be discussing at today's hearing. As an extreme, it's an extremely difficult time for our city. While it's initially appeared that we managed to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control earlier this summer, outbreaks have begun cropping up in communities throughout the city in recent weeks and threatening a return to the dark days of the past spring. As we begin to move into the colder months and inevitably return to indoor activities, the threat of increased community transmission only increases. We're here today to discuss how the administration is preparing for the possible next wave and what, if anything, we as a council can do to ensure that the city is adequately prepped in time. Mayor de Blasio declared a state of emergency back on March 17th, which remains in effect today. The emergency declaration provides the mayor with a number of powers, most notably for this hearing, the authority to suspend standard procurement rules for the city's purchase of relevant goods, including for personal protective equipment, testing kits, and ventilators. The goal of these emergency procurements is to streamline operations for vendors and contracting agencies by suspending some of the layers of review required before a vendor gets awarded a city contract. At the time of the mayor's March 17th emergency declaration, nobody anticipated we would be under a state of emergency for this long. We're now over seven months into the emergency with no clear end in sight, and it's important that the city's vendors continue to provide a consistent and reliable supply of PPE in order to protect against the next wave. We're here today to ensure that the mayor's administration has been doing everything it can to prepare for a winter wave of COVID-19 infections, including stockpiling critical PPE, testing kits, and ventilators for responsible vendors who deliver on their promises to the city. To that end, I'd like to thank my colleague, Council Member Richie Torres, for introducing proposed introduction 1980A, which would appoint a temporary special inspector within the Department of Investigation to review these emergency procurements during the course of the declared state of emergency. In normal times, this type of responsibility would typically fall to a patchwork of agencies and oversight bodies, but since we remain in a state of emergency, much of that oversight work has been suspended or delayed until long after a contract has been awarded. Uh, that's why I signed on to Council Member Torres' proposed introduction 1980A. I believe it enshrines some semblance of normal degree accountability in these anything but normal times. I'm glad to see several city agencies here today to testify, including the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the City's Economic Development Corporation, uh, we look forward to hearing from all three, as well as many city vendors and advocates who have also registered to testify. Uh, with that said, I know Chairs Valone and Cabrera are eager to make their opening remarks, so I won't take up too much more time, but I'd like to take a moment to thank the extraordinary work done by the Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council, Alex Falunov, Policy Analyst uh, uh, Leah uh, S., and Finance Unit Head John Russell for their hard work putting this hearing together. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're joined by Council Members Ku, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Mizell, Council Member Perkins, and Council Member Yeager. Now I'll turn it over to Chair Ballone for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Kalos. As Ben said, my name is Council Member Paul Ballone, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Economic Development. I'd like to echo Chair Kalos' statements in thanking Chair Cabrera and the member of all three committees, as well as the public advocate, Jumani, for submitting his testimony for today. 
A lot to cover in the interest of time. I will direct my opening statements toward the city's Economic Development Corporation, but obviously we have many questions for the other, other agencies here today as well. In preparation for today, our team has done a thorough review of EDC's decision-making throughout the course of the pandemic. And we see this hearing as another opportunity to review those decisions, glean the lessons learned and discuss how EDC is preparing to tackle the next wave if it comes and when it comes. The suspension, suspension of procurement rules at the outset of the pandemic did not directly impact the EDC standard procurement process since the EDC is effectively a city contractor itself and therefore not bound by agency procurement laws. Nonetheless, in response to the declared state of emergency in March, EDC's executive committee authorized the EDC to use any and all of its available funds in support of city's procurement efforts for PPP. This included $50 million in March to be used for the EDC's programmatic funds for PPE to be supplied to the h, &H hospital system and for other private hospitals in the city. They also set up a citywide procurement portal for PPE that directed vendors to EDC for proposals and rapid vendor responsibility determinations. These determinations took place with the assistance from the U.S. Department of Commerce to help in vetting offers from overseas. The majority of offers EDC received were not up to the city's quality of integrity standards. So EDC also issued solicitations for local and other domestic vendors to supply PPE during the critical first weeks of the pandemic. And our local manufacturers were there to step up to this need. When EDC put out a call for local businesses to manufacture PPEs, we got almost 3,000 responses. As of late of June, as of late of this past June, at least 15 domestic manufacturers, nine of which are New York City based, produced over 4 million face shields. And 14 local manufacturers produced 3.2 million isolation gowns. And EDC worked with local manufacturers to develop COVID-19 testing kits and alternative ventilators with his partners at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This accomplishment assisted in dramatically increasing the number of tests the city conduct each day and offered a more accurate picture of the caseload and infection here in New York City. In late April, the EDC Executive Committee approved an additional $50 million to purchase medical supplies, which included funds for testing kits to be used at public hospitals and community testing sites. With those funds, EDC and at the Economic Development Committee hearing back that we held in June had a target to help the city produce over 100,000 testing kits per week. At our June hearing, we also discussed EDC's rapid progress in working with local manufacturers to develop new supply chains to produce ventilators, surgical gowns, testing kits, and other critical equipment to support the COVID-19 relief efforts here in the city. And they did this by creating and preserving nearly 3,000 jobs, the minor majority of which were WMBE employers. As a result of these successes, the EDC Executive Committee allocated an additional $75 million toward PPE procurement for the city. In sum, as of June, EDC had authorized $175 million toward PPE, medical equipment, and testing. EDC expects to be re reimbursed for the city for those expenditures, and that $175 million number could be well higher today, which we are eager to hear. This committee, and I'm sure other committees as well, would like to know what total expenditures today and what EDC's expectation for reimbursement in light of the substantial budgetary shortfall the city continues to face. Most importantly, though, we want to know that the city is in good shape to handle the next wave of infections and that the critical supply chain remains intact over the coming months as cases continue to rise both here and elsewhere in the country. We hope to hear from EDC that things are going smoothly and that the PPE supply and stockpile are stable enough to withstand another round of infections and that equipment being procured is actually being delivered as advertised. We anticipate that our colleagues at EDC are working hard to keep us prepared for the next wave by applying both practices learned over the summer, and we hope these sentiments are echoed by the other agencies here today well. I know Chair Cabrera, Public Advocate Williams, um, who's not making it this morning, but has remarks. So I won't hold much longer. I'd like to hand it back to Chair Kalos, or actually to Chair Cabrera for his statement. And I'd like to thank our committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Senior Policy Analyst Emily Forgione, and Principal Finance, Financial Analyst Aliyah Ali for their always continued hard work in putting this hearing together. And now to our co-chair, Fernando Cabrera. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you to my co-chairs, Councilmember Kalos and Velon, for inviting my committee to today's hearing and your leadership on this issue. I am Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. Let me just take a moment to acknowledge other members that have joined in, Councilmember Yeager, Lander, Lewis, 
and PAL. Today, we are conducting oversight on the city's emergency PPE and medical supply procurement throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope to better understand how the city made contracted decisions in a moment of crisis, how the city adjusted to an evolving situation on the ground and how the city has prepared for a potential second wave or future public health crisis. And as you can see here today, we have several different agencies with us who play a role in PPE and medical supply procurement. We would like to better understand how all these agencies coordinated their emergency procurement throughout the crisis. As soon as the virus arrived in the city, there was a global rush on PPE and critical medical and critical medical equipment. Through executive order, the mayor suspended regular procurement procedures, which allow the city's contracting agency to procure supplies for the city's frontline workers on an emergency basis. Between March and June, the Department of City Wide Administrative Services secure roughly $1.2 billion in emergency contracts for things like PPE, cleaning supplies, testing kits, and ventilator equipment. I wanna thank Commissioner Camillo and her team at DCAS for working around the clock to ensure that our city agencies had the equipment they needed to continue serving New Yorkers. At our executive budget hearing in May, Commissioner Camillo shared that the city was already working on a long-term stockpile, and I'm looking forward to hearing an update on that work today. At the same time, the emergency procurement process was not without difficulty. Many of the city's contracts went to new vendors who had not been through the normal vending process. As early as April, news broke that several, several vendors had failed to deliver all of the masks and ventilators that DCAS had purchased. Other reports found that out of the 14 vendors DCAS contracted, contracted with, uh, with between March 6 and April 11, only one of them had delivered the full amount of N95 masks that DCAS ordered. As of mid-April, DCAS had canceled an additional $171 million worth of contracts for ventilators that never made it to the city. Committee is concerned about the occurrence of these unfulfilled contracts and hopes to better understand the issues. The virus is still present in our city and we must remain vigilant. We must plan for future outbreaks, ensure that we have the PPE and medical supplies we need to protect New Yorkers. Thank you to my colleagues for joining uh, today's hearing and the many staff uh, behind the seems to ensure this remote hearing runs smoothly. I wanna thank uh, to my committee called on the Dream Team staff for their work on their issues. On this issue, committee counsel CJ Murray, senior policy analyst Emily Forjong and Elizabeth Cronk and senior finance analyst Sebastian Bacci and my communications and legislative director, Claire McLevin. And with that, I turn it back to the Moderator, but let me also recognize we've been joined by council members Jonai, who, Rosenthal, myself, and Perkin as well. Thank you, chairs. I'm Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Contracts and Economic Development Committees of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the question and answer portion of the administration's testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony will be the first deputy commissioner from the Department of Design and Construction, Jamie Torres Springer, and the commissioner of investigation, Margaret Garnett. The following members of the administration will be available for questioning. From the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Director Dan Simon, First Deputy Director Ryan Murray, and General Counsel Victor Olds. From the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Deputy Commissioner Mercida Ebrich. From the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Director of Countermeasure Response, David Starr. 
and from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Executive Vice President, Lindsey Clinton. I will call on each of you shortly for the oath, and then again, when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the, the administration and the Economic Development Corporation who will be offering testimony or who will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? First Deputy Commissioner Torres Springer. Yes. Commissioner Garnett. I do. Director Simon. I do. Deputy Director Murray. I do. General Counsel Olds. I do. Deputy Commissioner Ebrich. I do. Director Starr. I do. Executive Vice President Clinton. I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Torres Springer, you may begin your testimony. Right, right before we do, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by more members, Council Member Inez Barron, uh, Council Member Lander, Council Member Powers, Council Member Rosenthal, and uh, Council Member Perkins, though he may have been uh, acknowledged before. And now you may begin. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, Council Members. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Uh, I'm Jamie Torres Springer. I serve as First Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Design and Construction. In addition to that role, I and Commissioner Lorraine Grillo have been coordinating the city's supply of medical personal protective equipment on behalf of the mayor's office for the last few months, and it is in that capacity that I'm appearing before you today. Very pleased to be here. I'm joined by several leaders from across city government who have played key roles in the city's efforts to ensure healthcare and other providers had sufficient PPE to address the unprecedented conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic, and council introduced them, so I'm not going to introduce them again, um, except to say that when my testimony is complete, uh, Commissioner Garnett will uh, provide some comments on intro 1980 as well. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has required extraordinary efforts in all areas of life for all sectors. As a public health crisis, it placed a great burden on our hospitals, nursing homes, primary care providers, and uniform services agencies who require medical grade PPE, uh, including N95 respirator and surgical masks, isolation gowns, nitro gloves and other items, as well as breathing assistance machines, including full service ventilator equipment. At different times over the last seven months, all of our healthcare providers have had shortages of PPE. And through concerted and heroic efforts, the city was able to step up and assist. These efforts saved many lives and avoided long-term health impacts for thousands of New Yorkers. They have positioned us to battle a potential resurgence and to recover as a city with a strong healthcare infrastructure. This work took coordination across many agencies and outside groups at a scale that's rarely seen in local government. I wanna particularly highlight the work led by the Economic Development Corporation, uh, working with New York City manufacturers to create local production capacity for face shields, isolation gowns, test kits, 
and bridge ventilation machines such as spiros and BiPAPs. Uh, over the course of a few weeks, this initiative highlighted the innovation capacity of homegrown businesses, enabled some of our partners to pursue federal contracts and other sourcing opportunities, and opened up future manufacturing opportunities for local producers. These efforts helped to build our citywide stockpile while positioning New York City as a reliable future supplier of PPE in the event of another crisis. There have been two phases of the effort, uh, and I'm gonna talk about both of them. An emergency global effort last spring to get PPE and equipment to healthcare and other critical workers during the height of New York City's surge in COVID-19 cases, and our current work to ensure that the city has a reliable, high quality, and fully independent stockpile of PPE and medical equipment adequate to meet all our healthcare needs for at least 90 days in the event of a future resurgence. So I would like to give you some key details on each of these phases. First, the spring 2020 peak surge activities. To fully appreciate the actions we took to get supplies and equipment to frontline workers, I wanna take a step back and recall that in the spring, New York City, as we all know, was the epicenter of the world's COVID-19 crisis. From March 16th to March 27th, the seven day average of cases went from over 700 to over 4,000 per day and eventually peaked on April 8th at almost 5,300. Hospitalization rates and ICU utilization soared and the city suddenly faced demand for PPE that numbered in the millions of units weekly for N95 masks, isolation gowns, gloves, and other critical items, which is an exponential increase from pre-pandemic averages. We faced an unprecedented and terrifying moment in our city's history. This crisis of PPE supplies was met by a major disruption of the global supply chain for these items, which saw massive price increases, uncertainty about sourcing, and competition between state and local governments to secure these items from all over the world. The city managed to effectively navigate this breakdown of the supply chain by sourcing an unprecedented volume of emergency PPE and standing up local production to supply the needs of the spring peak all while ensuring we are well positioned for reimbursement for these emergency purchases under the federal emergency declaration that covers the pandemic. Under Emergency Executive Order 101, which amended Emergency Executive Order 100, the mayor allowed modification of the city's procurement rules, enabling agencies to fast track purchases of goods or services necessary to combat the crisis. This allowed us to acquire life-saving equipment at the scale and urgency that we needed. We maintained a high degree of integrity in the process on behalf of the taxpayer during a difficult period. As is normally the case, each emergency contract is processed through the city's fiscal management system or FMS and therefore made public through tools such as Checkbook NYC. Multiple oversight approvals are required for all emergency contracts and to that end, Mox, uh, who's with us today, coordinated with government partners holding daily meetings with the controller's office to keep them aware of upcoming contracts and processing, communicating frequently with city council members who commendably did your part to identify potential suppliers of PPE and directed them toward our intake process, and also coordinating with the state and federal government on our sourcing efforts and stockpile buildup. Under the emergency procurement framework, the city quickly established a multi-agency operation excuse me, to manage the procurement of PPE from sourcing to delivery and distribution. Before the onset of the pandemic, our procurement teams had little experience in purchasing PPE or medical equipment, which typically was carried out by the city's network of healthcare providers, but it soon became apparent that a centralized interagency team would be necessary to find these goods in a destabilized supply chain where our traditional suppliers were completely overwhelmed. Through determination and a well-organized approach, this team was able to get these supplies into the hands of our healthcare workers and save lives. Uh, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Mayor's Office of Contract Services, and Economic Development Corporation all played major roles and are here with us today. The Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, set out standards to guide the procurement of these goods and distributed them upon arrival to healthcare providers, including hospitals, nursing homes, congregate care settings, funeral homes, primary care providers, uniformed emergency services providers, including EMS, uh, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, and many others. The sourcing team set up a process for intaking, evaluating, and prioritizing supplier offer offers to ramp up acquisition under pressing deadlines. This team evaluated nearly 5,000 supplier office offers in a few weeks' time, 
a massive effort that surfaced the most credible offers with the capability to deliver a high volume of priority items quickly. The offers included local producers, but local production could not meet the extent of the needs, and we were forced to look outside the city, state, and country for PPE and ventilators. Additionally, we have made an effort to utilize the MWBEs to the greatest extent possible as part of this operation, which has included PPE purchases and contracts for non-PPE response needs. At the same time that we were rapidly building a high volume sourcing operation, we legally established the city as an importer of record, which cut through typical process barriers and sped up the delivery of essential supplies at a time when transportation logistics were fraught with delays. We also cooperated with PPE purchasing consortiums and healthcare supply chain experts to build strategic partnerships and add further rigor to our vendor capability and risk assessments. Even considering this rapid mobilization, we operated in an emergency procurement context, not knowing if we would have the stock on hand to keep our healthcare and frontline workers safe, which required a constant balancing of urgency and risk. We considered a number of factors in determining whether to move forward with a purchase, including on-hand inventory, current and projected burn rates, product price, approval of product sample, delivery schedule, vendor capacity, vendor integrity, and the presence of multiple vendors per category to avoid single points of failure. No matter where each offer came from, it was evaluated against the same key criteria, whether it could reliably deliver a high volume of priority items on a short timeline at a competitive price. To perform vendor background checks, we emulated the responsibility determination process in an expedited fashion to ensure that risk controls remained in place as much as possible. In a small number of cases of the hundreds of orders that were placed, it became apparent that a contracted vendor could not fulfill the obligations set out in our agreement. In those cases, we canceled unfulfilled orders. And in just three cases, we are working with the law department to recover dispersed payments. On the whole, the global transportation and logistics supply chain was also severely strained by the onset of the pandemic. So we've worked with late delivering vendors to ensure that the agreed upon goods make it to us rather than moving to an abrupt termination because we need those products uh, in the city. City employees in ma many agencies stepped up to this generational challenge with an extraordinary degree of dedication and professionalism. City staff work countless hours, seven days a week, several lost loved ones to the pandemic and returned to work shortly after to do whatever they could to minimize the tragedy. We also saw a tremendous level of support from nonprofits, maintaining continuity of essential services during difficult times and well-meaning vendors who worked diligently to supply the city with PPE on condensed timelines. EDC consulted with local partners in adjacent industries, for example, life sciences, fashion, advanced manufacturing, to assist with the production of PPE and set up new sites for hospital bedding and food distribution. EDC also collaborated with local researchers and engineers to design a new model of ventilators known as bridge ventilators to meet the city's needs. The city also structured a new unit to respond to the outpouring of PPE donations we received. The COVID-19 public-private partnership team oversaw the creation of a web portal that allowed members of the public and business community to communicate with the mayor's office about potential donations and to schedule safe pickups. The city worked with corporate partners such as Apple, Facebook, Peloton, Louis Vuitton, and others who were able to donate large amounts of PPE to the city. Private partners were incredibly creative in how they repurposed their own stocks of PPE to donate to the city. For example, the Met Museum donated the PPE it uses for art restoration, and Anheuser-Busch redirected its distillery production from beer to hand sanitizer. All donated PPE went through the same rigorous quality assurance and distribution process as other acquired PPE. This sourcing effort required a similarly massive and yet detail-oriented approach on the back end for storage and distribution. The health department, DOHMH, monitored inventories at each hospital to make sure distribution matches localized needs. And we owe thanks to the major hospitals, emergency managers, and our partner, the Greater New York Hospital Association for their profound cooperation. 
DOHMH also provided evaluation capacity for samples delivered by vendors to ensure that the products being delivered to the city met our hospital standards. This well-organized back-end processing cycled back into the front end of our sourcing process by giving us a more detailed picture of week-to-week -week burn rates and needs, market feedback, and ways of improving our delivery process. Understanding that the pandemic hit our low income and communities of color the hardest, our crisis response and subsequent recovery efforts have paid special attention to these disparities and the longstanding inequities that COVID-19 have exacerbated. Healthcare providers in these communities were a high priority recipient of PPE during the emergency and recovery phases of our COVID response. NYCHA has facilitated free testing, PPE distribution, and meal deliveries for its residents. And we have worked to ensure widespread, widespread testing is available in communities of need. Uh, DDC is working with health and hospitals to create three post-COVID ambulatory centers of excellence in underserved communities in the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. The city has assembled a racial equity and inclusion task force to identify specific short and long-term policy options to put racial equity at the center of the city's response in areas ranging from food access and insecurity to housing and criminal justice. We are proud that this massive undertaking ultimately proved successful. While there were shortages in the system and we all saw that conservation and other measures were necessary at the height of the peak last spring, we were consistently able to provide PPE for frontline workers and we did so in a way that responsibly used taxpayer dollars. Now I wanna talk about the creation of the city's stockpile in the summer and fall and ongoing. Following the spring peak, we have used the time we had to prepare for any future resurgence. At the mayor's direction, we established a medical PPE service center that could supply the New York City healthcare sector with peak volumes of PPE from the spring for a full 90 days and meet any ventilation needs that we might have across the city's hospital system. In consultation with DOHMH, we set target stockpile figures based on peak daily burn rates across the full set of PPE categories used to treat COVID-19 in medical settings. We are stockpiling a dozen categories of critical items in addition to ventilators, including the following, what we call the big six major categories, 13 and a half million N95 masks, 37 million level three isolation gowns, 54 million three ply surgical masks, 185 million nitrile gloves, 900,000 goggles and 6 million face shields. I'm pleased to report that we are well on our way to reaching, and in most cases, exceeding these 90-day stockpile goals in the next few weeks. We have also coordinated with the governor's office and State Department of Health, who have recently required that hospitals and nursing homes maintain a 90 and 60-day supply of PPE, respectively. And these providers report that they are at or well on their way to these targets themselves, giving us even more confidence that the city is prepared for any future resurgence. We're building up our city owned ventilator fleet, which in combination with resources at hospitals and ongoing support from the strategic national stockpile would enable us to ventilate over 8,500 patients at one time in New York City. The service center is hosted at a secure location with the stockpile exclusively controlled by the city of New York. We have now established accounts and trained over 1,000 healthcare providers in a secure ordering system that can fulfill any PPE order within one business day, provided we get that order by 10.30 a.m. While we are confident that we have more than enough PPE for a future resurgence, we have worked with the health department to set allocations for each and every provider in the city based on usage data from the spring peak and scientific modeling making sure that providers servicing vulnerable populations and neighborhoods in need are prioritized. As we shared with the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus of the City Council, between March and the end of September, DCAS encumbered $901 million in funds to procure PPE, of which $124 million went to MWBEs. This is a strong performance considering a large portion of our PPE was sourced internationally. Looking forward, we are making every effort to ensure that we particularly direct new opportunities to MWBEs as we enter the recovery phase for New York City. 
As the city receded from the peak of this crisis and our sourcing operation built up a buffer of supplies, we shifted our sourcing into a more strategic, forward-thinking orientation. We increasingly work to build direct relationships with major global manufacturers and place high volume orders that would allow us to safely move toward the 90 day stockpile without incurring any immediate shortages. We have maintained a strong contract management function to secure more stabilized prices as the global supply chain for PPE has stabilized. During the second phase, we have also expanded the capabilities of this operation. We have moved beyond only supplying healthcare providers with PPE to becoming more of a citywide hub. For example, in June and July, we supplied 7 million cloth masks to nonprofit service providers and their clients. From a budgetary standpoint, our partners at the Office of Management and Budget implemented a new set of fiscal code structures in the early part of March to track COVID-related expenditures and set us up for reimbursement later. OMB and several other agencies are currently engaged in identifying grants and opportunities for reimbursement from federal and state agencies. This project will likely extend over the course of several years and we'll be happy, of course, to keep these committees apprised on the status of those reimbursements. Um, and uh, so then uh, turning to the bill being considered in this hearing, uh, intro 1980 shares the goals of many of the efforts that we took during the height of the crisis to gain assurance of vendor responsibility and promote transparency for our emergency spending. As I mentioned, we publicly disclosed all of the standard information on each emergency contract that would be made available for normal procurements, which includes a number of the data fields that were identified in this bill. We drew upon the expertise of the Department of Investigation to supplement our existing vendor background check process and collaborated with law enforcement agencies throughout the crisis period. We also kept the Comptroller's Office uh, notified each step of the way for emergency contracts the city authorized and their office continues to audit contract packages upon request. <clears throat> Several aspects of the bill would be difficult to operationalize. As I mentioned previously, delivery timelines have been less reliable than standard procurement due to the strain on global transportation logistics that the COVID crisis brought. Likewise, uh, vendors are unlikely to provide the city with accurate information about their on-hand inventory, which could complicate their bargaining position. Finally, the city's tight budget constraints would make it difficult to add new positions with potentially new skill sets. We're interested in working with the council to gain a better understanding of the intent of this bill. While much of the PPE stockpile has already been secured, we are always looking at new ways to add further rigor to our PPE procurement process. So in closing, I wanna thank everyone from every sector who stepped up to help us get through this difficult period, the health and human services providers who rapidly adapted their efforts to the new socially distanced environment, the industry and production groups who stepped up to provide us with PPE or lent us their knowledge of the market, and staff across the city who worked with tireless dedication to save lives. We're extremely proud of this team and through their diligence, we are well positioned to deal with the possibility of a resurgence. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify on this important effort. And I'll now pass it over to Commissioner Garnett to discuss the bill being considered in this hearing before we're happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tori Springer. Commissioner Garnett, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, good, good morning, Chairs Kalos, Cabrera, and Vallone, and members of the Committees on Contracts, Governmental Operations, and Economic Development. My name is Margaret Garnett, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. It's nice to be back in the Council again. It's my first time back since, since the pandemic started. Um, thank you for inviting me today to address the committee on intro, excuse me, intro bill 1980, which proposes establishing a special inspector within DOI to review contracts that were awarded by the city under emergency circumstances in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to continually evaluate such contracts to identify potential or actual deficiencies in monitoring and integrity and make recommendations and to develop an online public database, including specific indices from these contracts. I have reviewed this bill in detail and discussed it at length with the members of my team who have broad expertise in the area of contract oversight and vendor investigations. DOI cannot support this bill in its current form. In my testimony today, I will discuss what DOI's role has been in this crisis, what we have been doing as part of our anti-corruption mandate as it relates to COVID-19 contracts, 
and the reasons why I believe the current bill is not the best way to address what I think are the council's policy goals in this area. I will also describe a potential option that has worked effectively in the past to manage oversight and auditing of crisis initiatives and projects in the city. Although I oppose the proposed bill in its current form, I commend these committees for raising important concerns about accountability and integrity when the city is spending billions of dollars under emergency powers during a crisis without the usual scrutiny provided by the city comptroller and other oversight agencies. To be clear, my opposition is not to the need for action in some form, but rather to the structure and allocation of responsibilities proposed in this bill, which I believe are not the best use of city personnel or city funds. During a fiscal crisis for the city, it is more important than ever that beneficial oversight be conducted in a way that avoids unnecessary duplication of effort and deploys our scarce resources efficiently and effectively. I'd like to begin by outlining for the council what DOI's role is in contracting, both emergency and non-emergency, and what we have been doing to date to provide some oversight over the city's COVID-19 spending within the current structure and mandate of DOI. By way of background in the standard vendor contracting process, the Procurement Policy Board rules reinforce integrity and fairness in the city's contracting process. PPB rules call for the involvement of multiple agencies and checks, many of which are captured in the city's primary contract and procurement system known as Passport. DOI has only one discrete role in this normal process, and that is to provide information related to vendor name checks of the vendor and its principles for contractors that meet the Passport Disclosure Threshold which is currently $250,000 or more, whether on a single contract or over a 12 month period of multiple contracts. This is not a full background check, nor is it a responsibility determination. DOI's role in the contracting process is very limited. We check our own internal databases and then relay to the contracting agency, whether DOI has previously investigated a vendor or its principals and had substantiated findings from those investigations. The information DOI provides is only one small part of the vetting process. City agencies are expected to go through their own series of checks and ultimately make their own determination as to whether a vendor is responsible and whether a contract should be awarded. Other agencies such as the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the Comptroller also play very important roles and provide crucial oversight in this area. DOI is one resource for city agencies during this process, but we do not parse through individual contracts or bidding processes. We do not continuously evaluate the breadth of the city's contracts or procurement practices for integrity deficiencies. That is not DOI's role and it never has been. As this council knows, during the early weeks of the pandemic, there was a desperate need for personal protective equipment and other items related to COVID-19 response, including everything from ventilators and vital medication to large amounts of computing equipment that enabled city employees for the first time to do their jobs from home. This need was not new, unique to New York City. In particular, the procurement process for PPE became a chaotic seller's market, as Commissioner Torres Springer has described, with decisions about whether to purchase PPE necessitating swift action so a vendor did not sell its equipment or supplies elsewhere. Because of the heightened emergency, the city suspended its regular procurement process through emergency executive order, so it can navigate this critical situation more nimbly. Although the PPB rules contain emergency provisions meant to expedite the procurement process in an emergency, the executive order did not invoke that process, but simply eliminated the role of several agencies, including the city comptroller, which normally has a robust oversight role in the city's procurement process, and DOI, which has a much more limited role in vendor review for larger contracts, as I've described. However, DOI understood the value of even our limited role in the contracting process. As a result, after the mayor issued Executive Order 101, suspending the regular procurement rules, DOI proactively reached out to city agency contracting officers and to MOCs. For agency contracting officers, we offered to do our usual vendor name checks for them, even though they were no longer required by the EO and assured agencies of our ability to do them on an expedited, expedited basis for emergency contracts. To date, we have provided that service for approximately 120 vendors for potential contracts that, that fell within the EO. In addition, DOI asked MOX to provide DOI with a rolling list of contracts related to COVID-19 response. MOX began providing us that list in April and has sent us regular updates when we've requested. 
Internally, we then provide those lists to the relevant agencies inspectors general within DOI for them to review as they deem appropriate. Each inspector general geared their reviews to the specific needs of the agencies they oversee and the information provided to them by MOX, taking a range of actions from discussing the emergency contracts with their agency to checking vendors through a matrix of databases that we have at DOI or investigating whether certain purchases were made and if they comported with the intended purpose of the contract. Emergency procurements and suspension of the normal safeguards provided by procurement rules create two distinct categories of risk for corruption and fraud. The first kind of vulnerability is in the contracting process itself by, for example, creating opportunities for sweetheart deals for connected vendors or waste created through time pressures on agency contracting officers or the need to purchase certain materials for the first time. And some of these issues have already been addressed by Mr. Torres Springer. At DOI, we have endeavored to address this first kind of risk through the spot checking I've outlined above as well as following up on our usual intake of tips and referrals. The second kind of vulnerability is fraud by third parties, where bad actors take advantage of an emergency to steal from the city by, for example, promising materials that they cannot deliver, delivering defective materials, or taking advantage of programs intended to assist vulnerable populations in a crisis. DOI has also been active in targeting this risk category and we have multiple ongoing investigations in this area that I cannot discuss publicly. One matter that has already been announced was the federal arrest of a New Jersey man attempting to deceive and price gouge the city into paying him and his co-conspirators approximately $45 million for personal protective equipment he was not authorized to sell and could not deliver. DOI partnered in this matter with the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Notably, that case began with one of the city's best defenses when it comes to ensuring integrity in contracting, astute and proactive procurement specialists who implicitly understand the complex exacting details of contracting and related pricing and question them. In this case, procurement specialists at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services questioned the astronomical price, and then other city officials reached out to the manufacturer, which led to our criminal investigation. Finally, even where we have active and ongoing investigations, we have endeavored to give real-time feedback to agencies on their vulnerabilities and potential ways to address them to try to stem any ongoing losses to the city. DOI is primarily an investigative agency, albeit one with a very broad mandate. We are able to investigate any issue of corruption, fraud, malfeasance, and other related wrongdoing that involves the city. However, the breadth of that mandate means we must be strategic and focused in how we use our resources. Otherwise, DOI risks diminishing its ability to make an impact and broadly combat corruption, fraud, and waste. In, this, in the area of unprecedented emergency contracting, we have tried to use our resources and expertise effectively without draining resources away from our many ongoing investigations into other types of corruption and fraud throughout city government. I will turn now to outlining DOI's concerns with certain elements of the proposed bill. The legislation has the admirable goal of ensuring integrity in the city contracting process during a crisis situation, protecting the taxpayer dollars used to pay vendors and providing public transparency. DOI supports all of these important anti-corruption principles, and I commend the drafters of this bill for wanting to memorialize these good government efforts through legislation. However, DOI has a number of objections to the means by which the bill proposes to accomplish these laudable goals. First, as to subsection B of the bill that calls for the creation of a public database, the bill requires that DOI develop, populate, and maintain an online database with information that is neither gathered nor maintained by DOI. To the extent the data called for by the bill is kept at all, it is kept either by MOX or by each individual contracting agency. Moreover, DOI is an investigative agency. We have neither the personnel nor the expertise to perform the task called for by subsection B. Gathering the listed information from dozens of city agencies and putting it into a public database created by DOI would be a Herculean task for us, especially given our lack of experience in this type of work. Moreover, even if the resources were available, completing it within 30 days would not be remotely possible for DOI Given that qualified staff would have to be hired or diverted from other necessary tasks, the listed information would have to be culled from all of the contracting agencies. Hundreds of contracts would need to be manually reviewed. A database with public functionality would have to be created from scratch 
and staff would then have to manually input that information and check it for accuracy. Public databases can play an important role in crowdsourcing oversight of government operations and actions. In addition, this type of transparency can increase public confidence in how the government is run. But DOI is not a manager of city information or data, nor an expert in creating databases. Accordingly, assigning this task to DOI would not be an efficient or effective use of city resources. I would also urge these committees to assess whether this section of the proposed bill is duplicative of Local Law 76, which has already been passed by the council and goes into effect on October 23rd. And also whether the desired transparency is already achieved, at least in part, by existing mechanisms for public disclosure, such as the Comptroller's Checkbook NYC database. All parts of city government have an obligation to conserve our resources during this challenging time by avoiding waste and duplication of effort. Turning now to subsection A of the proposed bill, which calls on DOI to create internally a special inspector for COVID related contracting. I do not believe that staffing this function within DOI with the tasks described in the bill is feasible or is the best way to achieve the apparent goals of this legislation. As I've noted earlier in my testimony, DOI's role is as an investigative agency with a mandate to root out corruption, fraud, and wrongdoing. It is not structured or adequately staffed to be an agency that parses through and reviews each and every COVID-related contract in the city, both looking back to April and forward as the city continues to grapple with the pandemic. The continuous evaluation of contracts for monitoring and integrity deficiencies should be tasks of the contracting agency which are awarding and managing the contract on a daily basis. During normal contracting processes, a very important role is also played by the comptroller, which has an extensive contract approval staff and audit staff focused on and highly knowledgeable about the city's procurement and contracting. When serious discrepancies are found or when suspicious activity is identified, they should be reported immediately to DOI. And we step in at that point to investigate potential violations of criminal law or the city's conflicts of interest rules. We regularly receive and thoroughly investigate such referrals from the comptroller, from agency contracting officers, directly from MOX, as well as from tips that come into our complaint lines from a variety of sources. Becoming a de facto double check agency for all city contracts is not the best or most effective use of our expertise and staff. This is particularly true because the city is already paying for this very service to be provided by the skilled and experienced personnel at the comptroller's office who are constrained currently only because of their current emergency executive order. Restoring the contract registration and independent oversight role of the comptroller would accomplish all of the forward looking goals of this bill. Most significantly requiring DOI to duplicate a task better performed by the comptroller would limit our ability to conduct the breadth of anti-corruption work that we do across all city agencies and to do the type of in-depth investigations that DOI has become known for, all of which are focused on deterring corruption and holding wrongdoers accountable. The resources needed to establish a special inspector office as described in the bill would be significant and to do the kind of daily work outlined in the bill would take hiring a special inspector and a minimum of six specialized staff with audit or procurement expertise. This does not include the staff that would be needed to develop, populate, and maintain the online database described in subsection B. This cannot be achieved effectively through redeployment of DOI investigators from other units, and certainly cannot be achieved without significantly taxing DOI's current critical operations and investigations, which are already strained by staffing reductions due to the hiring freeze of the last seven months. Specifically, DOI has lost 36 staff due to attrition since January, including five data analysts, in addition to our normal stock of existing vacancies going into the calendar year. Due to the hiring freeze and fiscal crisis, we have been permitted to hire only one person since April. While I believe creating a special inspector unit to review contracts is misplaced within the structure of DOI, I also understand the council's desire to keep a close eye on emergency contracting and for greater visibility into these expenditures of city and federal money. To that end, I believe a better option would be for the city to consider meeting that need through an outside integrity monitor that, that reports to DOI, a strategy that has been used numerous times during prior crises in this city that have called for large scale contracting endeavors. For example, the ground zero cleanup and the multiple rebuilding efforts in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, among other extensive projects. 
Hiring an outside integrity monitor for a specific and specialized short-term task is ideal for a variety of reasons. Our experience in this area has shown that outside integrity monitor firms are able to gear up and deploy highly specialized staff quickly to perform the kind of work that is set out in the bill, faster and often for less money than could be accomplished by staffing a new unit within DOI. With a few experienced staff members, DOI can effectively supervise the work of these monitors who regularly report to DOI, particularly regarding any findings of wrongdoing or potential criminal conduct. A monitor could, for example, audit a selection of the contracts entered into during the emergency period with integrity and best practices in mind. On larger ongoing contracts, a monitor can assist in ensuring that vendors are complying with city rules and providing the promised goods or services. This option would allow DOI to act as it's mandated to do as an investigative agency, working with other investigators to find patterns of fraud and wrongdoing, working with prosecutors when laws have been violated, and issuing necessary recommendations within the city to tighten internal controls and improve practices. In contrast, as I have outlined already, DOI does not have the staff, nor is it currently set up to do what the bill would call for us to do. Commissioner, so I just want to jump in here for a moment because we have multiple agencies and three committees. If we could, we have your testimony. If we could get to your summary so that we could start getting into the other nuts and bolts of the committee, we appreciate it. Sure, Thanks. sure. Uh, I just want to close by saying that an integrity monitor would still require expenditure of new funds at a time when the city faces severe fiscal constraints. There are potential funding sources that could pay for this, including from federal money. I believe this alternative would accomplish the retrospective oversight goals of the bill for less money and without diverting DOI's already strained resources. As to the prospective goals, I believe restoring the independent oversight role of the comptroller is a better pairing of problem with existing expertise than requiring DOI to duplicate this function. Finally, the contracting database requirement of the bill, if it is needed at all in light of Local Law 76 and existing portals like Checkbook NYC, Likewise, should be performed by an agency with control over the data and expertise in database creation and management, none of which is currently possessed by DOI. I thank the committees for allowing DOI to share its significant concerns about this bill and our suggestions that I believe will help the city achieve many of these goals. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Garnett. I'll now turn it over to questions from the chairs. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. And a reminder to Chairs Kalos, Ballone, and Cabrera that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourselves during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Kalos, you may begin. I'm going to defer to uh, my uh, fellow chairs, uh, but before I do, I want to uh, recognize that we were joined by Council Member uh, Cornegy. So over to uh, my co chair, uh, Paul Ballone. Thank you, Chair Kalos. And I don't know if our committee council wants to give the council members that power to mute and unmute. It's a very dangerous power you're giving over to us. You, yes, you, you. <laughs> rethink that option before we take over. It's gonna be it's gonna be scary. <laughs> All right, so just a little, little background. Um, we have been having uh, the council of having a series of hearings over the last six months. So we all try to get a handle on what we all went through and what we're still going through. So this is the first time, and I'm very appreciative to Chair Kalos and Chair Cabrera to, to join forces to kind of hear from an interagency perspective, because whether it's this bill or it's, it's talked about, there's, there's clearly a need to do things better. And, and uh, that's what we're trying to learn. That's what we've gleaned from EDC. And I know Lindsay's here today. Uh, on that contracting process, and we'll just kind of touch that a little bit. But um, where I get concerned or where my anger comes in is when I hear that we are fine and we don't need to make changes. And uh, that last testimony basically just told me that during an emergency period, we don't need to shift resources to handle that because we have too much to do. That is not what we want to give a message out to the city or here as council members. So I wanna give our DOI commissioner a chance to address that. Your exact testimony was that during emergency contracting um, and times here that the resources, if we were to take resources away from our other mandates, we would not be able to do what we're mandated to do. 
That is not what I want to hear. What we want to hear is that during an emergency situation, we obviously, that's why it's an emergency, shift resources from other investigations that are not at the level of an emergency situation. And then we all come together to address this emergency so that we can quickly get out of the situation we're in, learn from it like from today, and then move forward and not just sit back and say, we had a lot to do. So can you kindly rephrase that or kind of help me through why that testimony was given? I think I have to unmute you, so here we go. Told you right off the bat, it's gonna be dangerous for us to do that. Okay, so I, you know, I'd like to clarify that my, during the course of the emergency, DOI did shift resources and responded very quickly as a need for our role arose. You know, just to give one example of the already announced criminal case that I mentioned um, involving the attempted theft of $45 million from the city, DOI, in, together with our partners at the U.S. Attorney's Office, moved extremely quickly in that matter, um, executing search warrants, conducting interviews, moving to um, charge and arrest and stop that attempted theft very quickly. So my my concern here is not about DOI's ability in the course of an emergency to respond doing what we do best in the course of an emergency. It's rather that what the bill is calling for is a tremendous use of resources now directed towards things that I don't believe would well, you, made, you made that quite clear that you don't believe and, and the bill was just one aspect of today's hearing. We're hearing for the first time a lot of agencies' responses to the emergency and how that handled lessons learned, what we did and how we can make that better. That's where all bills come from. The genesis of the bill is to how we can make things better, not to just create another layer of bureaucracy that no one wants. I don't even know where I am on the bill, but I always know that an issue that comes up in every hearing is we can always do better with interagency cooperation and handling anything whether it's DIFTA, whether it's the land one tenant, whether it's the police department, we always have to have the synchronicity between agencies. Clearly, when we hear from the other commissioners today, there was a complete unprecedented demand. And what we learned from the prior testimony is that the private sector and that the healthcare providers could not do what they normally could do. And that's what Jamie said, and that's what came in, and that's why the agencies had to find a way now to work with local producers to fill that need, because the hospitals were overwhelmed and the health and hospital corporations could not handle that. So now all of a sudden agencies had to figure out a way to handle something they hadn't done before. My question to you is, in that emergency situation, should we not, could, what have we learned that we could handle better if we have a second wave come up through your department, how can we shift since you can handle it on your own and don't need this bill? What is your vision to now reshift from what was done before to do it better for what may come in the future? Well, look, I, I, I do think that when it comes to DOI's role in the contracting, that we were able to respond to the emergency, as I said, even though our vendor name check services were no longer required by the executive order, um, we responded very quickly to ensure that we could provide that service to agencies that wanted it, even though it wasn't required, um, and to proactively make sure that we were doing, providing that at an even more expedited level than we normally would. But wouldn't so that, that require you to pull some just additional resources to handle that brand new emergency? I mean, all I'm working yes, for- and, is and at, as I said- no, actually, you said that you didn't. So what we're trying to find out is, are you willing to shift resources to handle the next demand? I, I think you've misunderstood my testimony, respectfully. We did shift resources to respond to the emergency contracting needs and to assist in any way that we could. My objection is to additional resources mandated by this bill, which I don't believe would serve the goals of the council. But DOI has and will continue to make its resources available to respond to the unprecedented emergency, whether it's 
our role in contracting and doing vendor name check services, or our role responding very quickly to investigate potential wrongdoing. So Commander, I'll just, there's, there are so many things today, I didn't even plan on going down that route, but the lawyer side of me is when I hear testimony, I have to respond to it. So you're staying with your position and that's fine, but I'm telling you that all that does is unite the council members to make sure the bill gets passed very quickly. Now with the DCAS and the contracting side of it, you know, I've heard from EDC in the past is to the emergency and, and how agencies had to form new identities to get through this. What we didn't hear is, is the DCAS version of the contract and with MOX too, um, the ability to appropriate new contracts and how that demand now coming forward with November around the corner and winter and we see some spots throughout the city spiking, some areas through obviously, you know, uh, someone like a family like ours that went through this, this virus and there's nervousness coming. So we wanna hear what were the lessons that were learned from that that now we can handle what's coming and hopefully it doesn't, but obviously there's going to be spikes in some ways and we're seeing that. So what were some of those contractual lessons that were learned that we can quickly respond? And I know you mentioned that the stockpiles are um, at a much better place and that gives us all and you gave us some numbers. You may want to go over that again. And the other issue that came up in prep with the other chairs was where are we putting all this stuff and do we have the ability to stockpile it safely so that we can get to it when we need it? Yep. Help me add out. <laughs> Definitely don't want me doing this. There we go. Thanks, uh, Council Member. Uh, thank you, everybody unmuted from the administration. Uh, Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Council Member, uh, for those questions. And uh, I'll get started and see if my uh, my colleagues uh, want to make some comments. I, I mean, I, I think the, the gist of what we're uh, communicating today is that the major lesson we learned is that we have to be ready to provide healthcare workers and others working in medical settings with PPE um, in accordance with a potential surge. And um, having learned that lesson, uh, you know, we set out to have this stockpile in hand. Um, so when you take the combination of the hospitals having reporting that they are in compliance with the state executive order and have 90 days or more of PPE and us having a dedicated 90 day stockpile, we feel very confident that we're gonna be able to address any potential surge um, but uh, we also, uh, what we've described in our testimony uh, is we've also put the capacity in place to be able to contract quickly uh, within this emergency if we find that we're running low and we need more. Um, and we do have uh, really an international network, uh, the importer of record status uh, that really allows us to be the priority uh, recipient of this PPE through contracts around the world. Um, so we're, we're we're very comfortable with the position that we're in. Um, the stockpile is in a secure location. Um, it's, uh, it, it's in a, uh, a place where, uh, as I mentioned, if we have an order that comes in before 1030 in the morning, we will fulfill that order within one business day. Um, so again, is, we'll that, is that stockpile consistent from whether it's health and hospitals, private hospitals, nursing homes, mm -hmm. are we all on the same level of comfort or do we have to work with, with that? Uh, well, so, so we have worked with all of those providers over the last few months, starting with looking at what they burned, their burn, their burn rate of PPE in really in April in the peak, which was the starting point for how big a stockpile we needed. And then we have a lot layers and layers of relationships and interactions, particularly through the health department, um, which, uh, you know, uh, David Starr may have uh, some additional comments he wants to make, um, but where we're working with the Greater New York Hospital Association, interacting regularly with managed care providers. Um, we have a number of different channels to talk to the nursing homes. Uh, you know, obviously congregate care settings are, are regulated by city agencies. And so we talked with all of them and we're very comfortable that we are able to supply all of their peaks um, based on that April peak. Is there a shift from demand from whether it's PPE provisions to testing? and being able to, whenever there's a vaccine, and they'd be able to, as even the governor's given lately, saying that the concern of how that overwhelming demand is going to be to get through the city, are we gonna be able to shift to meet that new need? Yeah, I think so. I mean, testing has been very, has gone very well. Um, we have testing set up all over the city and we've got uh, sufficient kits uh, for testing. 
maybe I'll ask Dave to comment on the uh, efforts to stand up, uh, be ready for uh, mass vaccination in the city. Dave, would you like to say something about that? And then the last question for me, so while you guys are discussing that one, and then we'll share it up to turn both, both chairs, um, is the EDC incorporation into this process, right? Obviously, EDC is a nonprofit stepped in to do contracting and help, but how is that relationship with your agency and with EDC, I know Lindsay's here, how is that going to continue since we got into some unique contracting during this crisis? Will EDC still be continuing their role in, in procuring and working with new manufacturers and producing of the equipment? Will agencies or the hospitals shift back? How do you envision what we went through versus where we are today with EDC's role? And Lindsay, you can jump in with that too. And then I'll turn over to the chairs and then we'll, we have our council members waiting too. Great. Oh, you're on mute. Oh. Okay. Great. I, maybe I'll try and say it um, unmuted just because I'm trying to direct some traffic here um, with some questions. So, um, maybe, Dave, uh, can you speak to the, the preparedness for the vaccination effort and then uh, over to Lindsay at EDC? Sure. Can you hear me? I wasn't allowed to unmute myself earlier. Sorry. Um, regarding the vaccine, uh, the we've been told by the federal government at this point that it will all, any vaccine that arrives will arrive with a, a PPE sufficient to support the vaccination efforts. So that distribution and the allocation of the I know that's going to be a whole separate hearing, but just yeah, that's a the allocation. Me, well, if you can just give us a preliminary forecast of how you envision that's going to happen, because obviously we, we went through just getting tested for COVID-19, that was a battle into itself to find a place to do it. So we don't want to make sure that happens again here. Right. Um, well, unfortunately, this is a federally driven operation and we are and there are multiple vaccine candidates in, in phase three trials. Now we're getting we get different information almost weekly about what will be a, what may be available and how it should be allocated. The mayor's uh, press announcement yesterday described, uh, um, you know, the process that we're actively working with our state and federal partners to figure out exactly how this is going to work. But there will be a sort of a phase rollout depending upon um, uh, depending upon availability of what type of vaccine and how much is available. First, uh, the phase one distribution will provide, you know, when we have a limited number of doses uh, available to us, will be primarily reserved for the healthcare system, healthcare personnel, frontline workers, and other vulnerable populations. And then a phase two distribution, which could occur as early as 2000, I mean, January, January, February, will be that will we'll see more widespread availability and uh, the current planning really relies New York City has a very robust vaccine distribution infrastructure on a daily basis so it really that's really the backbone of our that will be the backbone of the vaccine operations but um, I think before anything we should all go get our flu shots and I hope everyone uh, participating in this has done so mm -hmm. I don't have my button on but I got it Monday Perfect. I think we'll leave that. That's a whole separate set of questions for vaccine <laughs> distribution. So we'll leave that for another day. Uh, Lindsay, if you can just with EDC on, on how you were there at the beginning versus where we are today and how that contract and manufacturing process will work with our sister agencies for the coming, for the coming, if it comes or not, but the next wave of this pandemic. Sure. Thank you, Council Member Vallone. So uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, EDC coordinated extremely closely um, with our partners at other agencies. I can distinctly remember the first call uh, that we were on together back in the third week of March, where we spoke with DCAS and DOHMH about exactly um, what they needed. And we talked about what we felt could be produced locally uh, because traditional global supply chains were um, not able to deliver in that time. Um, and ever since that first call that we had, we have connected multiple times a week. And then at some point during the summer, we uh, ended up scheduling a weekly call where we had um, the head of MOX, the head of DCAS, um, many people from the EDC team, uh, as well as many others from City Hall to coordinate on what we should be locally manufacturing versus what was already covered uh, by quote traditional 
uh, supply chain avenues. Uh, since then, we've been working to um, capture everything that happened in uh, case studies and kind of capturing the process that we went through so that any future contracting or any team members that come after us uh, in future crises or even in a, a second or third wave um, will be prepared. Uh, and that includes capturing the specs of the things that we made. You know, EDC working with local producers was able to produce 8.4 million face shields, 4.2 million hospital gowns, a million testing kits, and 3,000 bridge ventilators. We want to make sure that the specs for all of those goods are captured as well so that anyone who needs to make them in the future, um, God forbid, uh, is able to do so in a very efficient manner. Uh, I would add that our efforts now are also um, more strategic as well and not just tactical. We're having um, several different conversations with incredibly innovative local manufacturing partners about what it might look like to create a medical grade manufacturing facility. Uh, what are the uh, items that are in demand that would make sense for them to produce into the future? And then as uh, the testimony reflected, there are some producers who, uh, continue to set their sights on uh, serving other municipalities or providing smaller private companies with PPE. And so, and then also uh, applying for federal contracts. So um, we could have the beginning of a new industry in New York City. We'll see uh, what happens there. Thank you, Lindsay. And I'll turn over to our chair, Ben Kalos and Fernando Cabrera, and then I'll come back for just to follow up, finish up with some EDC questions. Thank you guys. Thank you so much uh, uh, to the co-chairs for inviting my committee to be part of uh, today's hearing. I'm going to uh, change uh, focus on talking uh, with DCAS. I see we have our deputy commissioner. Uh, welcome. Uh, and if you could provide me the to the point answer, because I, I have several questions and I just want us to be parsimonious with our time. And sure. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'll be reading the questions because that's the quickest way to go through this. Uh, did, did DCAS have his own uh, vetting of any vendors? And if so, what criteria uh, did you use to vet? Yeah, absolutely. So DCAS and MOX early on uh, developed a, you know, sort of straightforward uh, vetting process. It's one that we use for all of our vendors. It's very similar to how we vet vendors on a standard procurement um, with, of course, you know, with the need for expediency. Uh, and so it includes things like background checks. It includes LexisNexis. Uh, views of a, a federal department website. Um, and, and also we worked very closely with DOI to, uh, to get um, BNCs completed within 24 hours. Um, and so that was also part of the vetting process. So you basically had the same system you had before with the exception of the controllers and DOIs uh, vetting. Is, is that pretty much what we have here? Well, DOI did did um, did jump into the process uh, about a month later, but yeah, absolutely, we we tried as much as possible to stay in line with what our existing process was. Thank you. Uh, you know, as of June 15, DCAS had procured over 1.2 billion dollars worth of PPE, medical supplies to support the COVID-19 response. Uh, the list of items procured that you provided to the government operations com uh, committee include the items that yet to be delivered. So my first question here, were all items eventually delivered? And did DCAS procure any additional items since June 15 or so? Can you uh, uh, list uh, the items and how much uh, do we spend? Well, I might need a, I might need a follow up on on providing you a list of everything that was procured after June fifteenth, if that's okay. Speaking. But generally speaking, yeah, the city has received the bulk of what we've what we've paid for, and and majority of of what we've um what we paid for is 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 you know all the PPEs that we've listed previously. So it's all the same stuff. It's masks. It's it's ventilators. It's you know uh, uh, gloves. Uh, it's all of those items. But yeah, I can follow up uh, se separately afterwards with a full list. And just for the record, after June 15, uh, you had additional items, right? 
I mean, there were testing stuff that came up afterwards that those aren't PPEs, but yeah, I mean, as needs continue to evolve, we, we, we quickly responded to those. Yeah. Okay, great. And how many vendors in total did GCAS purchase PPE from? And how many of those vendors qualify as MWBs? So um, I, I, I don't have the exact count, uh, but about 14% of all of our uh, spend uh, went to an MWB, a city certified MWE. Is that uh, the average uh, in during a normal cycle? Um, so in our goods universe, uh, I don't I, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but uh, so with the, in our goods universe, uh, our numbers for MWE uh, utilization is a little different. Uh, for outside of goods, we're usually around about twenty to thirty percent. We're actually doing really good, um, but uh, but goods is a, is a harder market for the MWEs. And, 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 uh, and, and, and council member, if I if I might just uh, if yeah. I might just quickly mention, just I think I mentioned this in the testimony, but um, the although we're at fourteen uh, percent, a great deal of what we had to source in this case was from international sources. So it's it, you would think it would be actually a much higher number when we look at just domestic sources that could be city certified. I appreciate that. Uh, in fiscal twenty nineteen, before COVID nineteen, DCAS. $41.7 billion worth of contract. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, procurement costs were unexpected in the 20 in fiscal 20 adopted uh, budget. How much room is there in, in this uh, fiscal 2021 adopted budget for new COVID-19 uh, related procurement? I think we'd have to. Margin. How much of a margin do we have in our budget to be able to purchase um, more I, items? I think we'd have to uh, get an answer from OMB on that uh, for you, Council Member. Uh, other than to say, I mean, we, we're prepared to do what we need to do to make sure that we have PPE for healthcare workers and for safety. So money is not an issue. Well, I, you know, we're always very careful, but certainly this is a, this is a you know this is matter matter of life and death, um, and so we're we're prepared to do what we need to do. But you have the federal backing, right? I mean, the most most the, most of the funding that was supposed to be matched uh, to uh, reimburse us did that come in? Well, so you, I'm glad to talk about that for a moment, Council Member. The, we do believe the majority of spending to date will be reimbursed by FEMA. Um, I, I do want to note that moving forward, uh, there are many costs that may be ineligible because FEMA recently changed its policies as of September 15th, um, such that it'll only fund PPE. Uh, we think it's, the guidance is actually still very unclear for emergency medical care, testing, food programs, and shelters. Um, so this is a significant issue. It, it does put uh, a significant amount of city expenditure at risk of not being reimbursed. Um, but we do expect that all of our spending before September 15th will be reimbursed. And we're certainly working with and advocating with FEMA to try and clarify that guidance so that we're able to, to get reimbursed for this emergency spending. So the, after September 15th, what percentage do you anticipate will not be reimbursable? Uh, as I said, things are very unclear okay. uh, in terms of the guidance. Um, there are, uh, I, I will say there are hundreds of millions of dollars at risk uh, of, of not being reimbursed if we don't get clarity from FEMA. Wow, that's a scary. It is, it is very deeply concerning for us. In light of yeah. our fiscal nightmare that we, we're facing right now. According to uh, the mayor's uh, management report in goal 4B, DCAS states that the value of co cost avoidance increased by 183% when compared to fiscal 2019 due to two major rejections, totaling 3.5 million in cost avoidance for KN95 masks, as well as a higher prevalence of non-compliant products found by quality assurance inspectors. So here's a question. Can you provide additional information regarding what the differences were between DCAS and MOX, vetting process or contract, and inspections of products conducted by quality insurance inspectors? 
Sure. You know, I I think one of the uh, incredible things that we do as a city is to ensure that we're not just setting the safeguards up front in the procurement process or in the contract itself, but that once we receive product, we're we're reviewing it to ensure that it's in line with product specifications and that it's safe to use. Uh, And so all of our product is inspected uh, here once once we receive it. Um, And so what you're what you're quoting is actually the number now is seven point five million. Um, of rejections that we've made uh, related to things that we've we've bought in response to to COVID uh, and all PPE related, uh, and it, these are products that we've we've deemed to not meet uh, you know sort of safety uh, needs or, or product specifications, and we rejected it and require the vendors to come back with a replacement, a suitable replacement. How do you how do you how, what was the criteria used to determine whether EDC or DCAS uh, we're going to do a certain amount of um, a certain type of procurement. Uh, for example, uh, in my, my understanding, EDC procures medical supplies. Uh, how did you determine that? And uh, did that have anything to do with level of efficiency, um, expertise, capacity? Um, so I think it's really important to note that you know the, the city did not take sort of like a single approach here. Um, so, you know, EDC spoke, spoke a bit about sort of, you know, engaging local, uh, local businesses to manufacture product, you know, here in the United States, uh, here in New York. Um, but but we, also, we also developed a, a sort of diverse portfolio of, of, of contracts. Uh, you know, so that we didn't have a single point of failure. It wasn't just what we can, you know, manufacture here locally. We were working with businesses overseas. We were working with businesses across the United States. I mean, we had several contracts in place for every PPE so that we would always have product coming in at any given time. And so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, that we made a decision as to what would go to EDC or what would go to DCAS. In fact, we all kind of jumped in uh, holding hands together <laughs> to kind of, you know, work through the strategy and work through sort of getting us as much as we can in place as quickly as we could. So what I, so what I hear uh, is that, what I hear is that everybody was pretty much, for lack of a better term, hustling, trying to find which open door was a legitimate <clears throat> open door and just knocking and knocking and knocking. It's, it's we worked like, hard. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I call it healthy. <laughs> yeah, we well. worked really hard. <laughs> I appreciate that. Council uh, member, if, if I could add, yeah, I, yeah. I would say that, you know, at the, in the spring surge, uh, first I want to say that, you know, only because you asked about the difference between MOX and DCAS's vetting process, Merced is 100% right. This is all one team. You're, you're talking to a diverse set of city employees here across multiple agencies, um, but the most heartening thing about all of this is that we came together right at the very beginning. Um, we're co-located when we were still in the office very early in March, um, and that has not uh, changed. We have been in lockstep, uh, locked at the hip, and doing everything uh, together, and that and that's been uh, that's been really great. Um, I will just say about the you know the market at that point in March and April uh, was that uh, you know typically the city and its buying power uh, provides us all the leverage and we choose vendors. Um, But back then the vendors were choosing us. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we had to explore absolutely every avenue um, that we could. And that took us to some uh, dark places, to be quite honest. Um, You know, Commissioner Garnett and DOI were there also from day one uh, in lockstep. And, you know, there was a criminal element out there. There is, uh, you know, a, a disgusting gray market uh, of folks trying to take advantage. Um, and it was incumbent upon all of us to be uh, hyper aware of those things. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate how helpful DOI has been from the very beginning and how much they jumped in to the fray with all of us. Um, I okay. hope that didn't get lost in the beginning. Um, but that, that was the state of the market in the spring um, where you know they were, they were choosing us more than we were choosing them. I have to tell you, I, I... I sympathize uh, with every agency. I was personally getting tons of calls every day. Oh, I know somebody. Yep. <laughs> you know, the, the, oh, I know a guy that in this company, and we had this many, you know, and we were making all the referrals. You guys do the vetting, of course. And so I, I know it was almost an impossible task. I just got two quick questions. 
uh, and that is uh, uh, back to DCAST. Um, how many COVID related contracts did uh, DCAST cancel because the vendor failed to deliver the order of supply sometime? And what's the total dollar amount of these contracts? Yep. So we canceled about $520 million in contracts that did not uh, result in uh, any product. Um, and it's important to note that that was at no risk to us. Uh, we did not lose any money there, and those were all canceled uh, procurements. Wow, that's, uh, that's good to know that uh, no city funding uh, went before we got it. And last question, and that is uh, related to the unions. We haven't uh, anything so far related to the union. What kind of feedbacks, uh, feedback you were getting uh, from the unions, um, uh, complaints, concerns during this process? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying we've had a really good dialogue with all, you know, all components of the healthcare sector. Um, been very helpful in articulating what their needs were. I mean, as we've said today, we know conditions in the spring were not ideal. Conservation measures were required. We all saw uh, some of those images of the struggles that occurred. And we heard that directly from labor, certainly as well in the healthcare field. And uh, that's, you know, again, one of the reasons we're responding by making sure that we have this, this very adequate stockpile of PPE. Um, I, uh, I might ask Dave if he has any further comments, just because DOHMH is our primary liaison to the hospital sector. Uh, anything else you wanted to say about uh, what we've heard from labor? You're on mute. Is it, could, could we um, unmute? There, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have much to add in, except for the fact that we, one instance that we work directly with 1099 to actually distribute PPE to some of their memberships. So um, that's, and we got some positive feedback from that. But again, just to reiterate what you said, we heard, we felt the pain and we're struggling. I think all of this entire team were struggling with trying to accommodate during the peak, and it was a difficult time. I just want to make sure that if, God forbid, we have another spike, uh, that our our working uh, people in the city of New York are fully protected. That they have the equipment. That they're not using masks. That you know they have to use for three weeks in a row the same mask uh, and masks that actually work for the type of job. Uh, that they're doing and that this next time around uh, we, we, we could anticipate it wasn't like back in March we were caught off guard um, that we, we definitely uh, be prepared. I want to turn it back. I want to thank you all uh, and thank you for your answer. I want to give it back uh, to the coach here, uh, Ben Kalos. I know he has numerous questions uh, to ask. Thank you. I want to thank my co-chairs for their questions, and I'll do my best to confine my first round of questions to the same 20 minutes for each of us. Uh, I'd like to cover emergency powers, specific contracts, MWBE, local servicing, and perhaps most importantly, understanding our stockpile and distribution. So please make your answers brief and to the point. Uh, I want to just go through a quick timeline for folks. My rabbi does it at services. I'm, I'm sure Chair Cabrera does it at his services. But so after my questions, which should hit us around 155, we'll hear five minutes of questions from each of the council members, Rosenthal, Barron, Joe and I, and Cornegie. That'll take us to about 1215 before a second round. Uh, then we're going to hit a uh, four panels of testimony beginning after the noon hour. Uh, starting with labor organizations representing our frontline workers in our hospitals, essential workers in public schools and shelters, an MWV supplier of PPE, doctors, and members of the public. Uh, I want to start uh, with just a, a thank you to those at EDC. When the pandemic started, my office set up a clearinghouse for securing PPE at coronavirus at bencales.com. It's still active to this day, and I want to thank uh, EDC for working with us on vetting many, many, many providers. Uh, I'd like to just jump straight into the emergency power. So in August, New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer uh, sought a reinstatement of his oversight power, stating that in April 2020, 19% of registered COVID-19 emergency contracts were for PPE, whereas in June, uh, PPE comprised only 3% of all these emergency contracts. 
Will the mayor restore oversight to the controller? Uh, direct that to Dan. Thanks, Council Member. Um, I would say that the, the, the mayor has been very clear that um, he is going to use every tool at his disposal uh, to protect New Yorkers, um, and this is one of them. Uh, uh, I will also say that you know no one uh, takes any comfort from uh, this change in the procurement process. Um, the controller absolutely belongs there. Um, we want their office uh, included um, uh, through the normal procurement process. And when things become normal again, um, I'm certain the mayor will make that decision uh, at the, the right time. The controller has stated uh, that the mayor is not providing contract documents to him. Uh, I, how many COVID related emergency contracts uh, are there? How many have actually been provided to the controller? Uh, and when will they be provided? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so uh, one thing I want to say is uh, right at the very beginning in mid-March when things blew up uh, and, and, the, and the executive order was issued, um, I set up a call, a daily call uh, with the controller's office and the, and the deputy controller for contracts. And throughout the spring, we had a daily 9.30 a.m. meeting. Um, in the summer, we scaled it back to three days a week and, it, and that remains. We have a three-day-a-week uh, meeting uh, with them every morning. Uh, each, each morning, three days a week. Um, and so in, in no way are we interested in um, uh, giving them the Heisman uh, around this stuff, so to speak. Um, and so uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, we have addressed all of the issues that they've brought up to the table throughout, throughout uh, the past seven months. Um, they have access to all the data, as Jamie mentioned in his testimony, all of the the contract data that you would have for any contract issued and executed by the city is available um, in the city systems. Um, there is a technical barrier to actually physically moving the contract documents over to them. It's very much in the weeds, but we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started click, manually clicking and downloading, putting them into folders so that they can be transported to their system. We have about 20 or 30 uh, so far and we hope to increase uh, uh, that amount uh, with, uh, with our internal staff uh, clicking away in an archaic system that we have to use to get over there. Um, but we in, if I could snap my fingers and move all whatever the you know, 800 contracts over to them for their review, I would do that. Um, okay, and so they, they also, sorry, they also know that um, if there was anything, any pr contract in particular that they wanted to see, we would hand it over right away. Um, this isn't, we're, we're not hiding the ball here. This, I mean, they can have whatever they want. I, I, I will acknowledge, and just for anyone on social media or in the press or just a regular resident, um, I, I have been requesting contracts quite frequently and I, I get them. Uh, so the number is 800 contracts. You're saying that you're currently clicking away 20 at a time each day. So is that 40 days or that's how long it'll take for the technical fix? But I, I just want to make sure that as we're talking about possible legislation to bring in yet another party uh, that we, we that we have a date certain one, this will happen. Yeah, it's it's a bit slower than you're than you're uh, laying out there. So we've we're using uh, our staff. They'll have they have to click through each document, put them in a folder. We have to get a link from the controller's office so that we can upload it to the link that they want. Um, takes a lot to get it in the format right, that they want. The controller access to the same system so that they can do the clicking if they want to. Happy to. And and and, 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 they're, and they're, they're, they're well aware of 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 this, okay. and so uh, you yeah, know we're this this is uh, you know we're, we're communicating with them all the time. They're fully aware of what we're doing, um, okay. and they had they can have access whenever they want. Okay, uh, and I'll take that access as soon as possible too. So in <laughs> August. New York Post reported that the controller cited two contracts as examples. There was a $120 million uh, contract with digital gadgets led by de a de Blasio donor that failed to deliver uh, their masks and ventilators, according to the New York Post. Uh, have they ever delivered? Has this contract been canceled? Have we gotten our money back? To anyone with knowledge. 
Sorry. Yeah, Dan, go ahead, please. Uh, well, look, I was going to, Mercita can, oh, I see. Uh, okay. can, yeah. can, <laughs> can provide additional details about the specific contract. I would just jump in to say that, um, you know, and, and just highlight um, the fact that uh, there are a few examples out of the, uh, the, the, the billions of dollars that have been spent in COVID response. And I think that uh, is a testament to the, the rigor and the process that we put around uh, these procurements uh, over the past seven months. But uh, Mercedes can certainly provide additional details. Yep, thank you. Um, yep, the, the contract with Digital Gadgets, uh, they actually did deliver masks. We were able to pay them out for, for those masks that they delivered uh, and the uh, ventilators contract was canceled. How much money did the city get back? The city did not, we did not prepay on any of that. So we only paid uh, for the mask. How much it, did it was we not pay a, for it, it was not a get back. Okay, how much did we pay for the masks? So out of 120 million, how much went to the de Blasio donor? I will have to get back to you on the exact figure. Uh, I'm going to be asking questions for the next 15 minutes. If you can ask somebody on your team to pull it and make sure, sure. we get the answer by the time we are, I'm done with my line of questioning or second round. Uh, we, along the same lines, as you may have read in Cranes, in May, I questioned $91.5 million contract with Woodhull Medical Supply, uh, where at the time they had not delivered. What is the status of that contract? Did they ever deliver? Have we ever paid? Have we gotten paid back? Yep. So we uh, we did uh, we did receive masks again from Woodhull. Uh, everything else, uh, I think the other contract that we had with them was for isolation gowns. That was also canceled. Okay. Uh, how much did we end up paying to Woodhull, and is there any money outstanding that they owe us back? All right. So I don't have that figure yet, but I'm going to get it for you. But I do have it for digital gadgets. It's nine point one million. Thank you. So out of one hundred twenty million, that went down to nine point one million. That's so right. you, you might not be surprised to, to learn that in May, I read in Vogue uh, that 700 costume designers teamed up from Broadway to form the Broadway Relief Project to manufacture PPE with EDC. Is that contract still active? How many jobs have been maintained and how much was produced? Happy to take that one, Council Member Kalos. Uh, so we were thrilled that the Broadway community stepped up to work to supply PPE to the city. Um, costume designers, actors, seamstresses came together to execute on these contracts. Uh, in total, uh, the group that we were working with created almost 50,000 isolation gowns um, and they were delivered and that ended up creating or preserving 190 jobs. Uh, so it was, um, it was great to work with them on those efforts. Uh, there were in total three contracts, so two of those contracts were for hospital gowns, one was for coveralls, and uh, that third contract for coveralls actually ended up being canceled uh, because the city's needs shifted. Um, we did end up paying for labor and materials um, in that contract. I actually had reached out. Um, I, I, there was a factory that makes high-end men's clothing that could actually make the uh, KN95 masks, and, and I don't know if there's a status on that and keeping that local factory open. I reached out on behalf of one of our brothers and sisters in labor. Uh, well, Council Member Kalos, first of all, I'd say I appreciate all of the leads that you sent our way over the course of the last eight months. Um, it's been very helpful, and we have. Um, done everything in our power to vet those leads and then update you on the progress around those. I don't know which one you're referring to specifically. Right? I'll, I'll see I'll see if I can pull it for a second round. Uh, I want to move on because I want to cover some more topics. And I have about 10 or so minutes left. So let's just say three minutes on the next topic, as it were. So this committee has oversight over MWBE uh, in uh, I, I want to acknowledge that our economic development chair, Paul Vallone, our women's and gender equity chair, Helen Rosenthal, who is on and will be asking questions in the first round, uh, I think first person to ask questions, as well as uh, the GovOps chair Cabrera, we, we're all very focused on this. And so I know that in answer to uh, Cabrera's question, uh, Mercita, you, Deputy Commissioner Mercita, uh, Rick, you cited that 17% was about that rate. Was that 70% of the $1.2 billion? Was that 17% of what, what is your denominator 
uh, for how many of the contracts went there because the controller said that only 10 MWBEs that he surveyed got COVID related contracts. So uh, where, what is the denominator when you say 17% and uh, how many MWBEs actually got contracts? So uh, it's actually 14%. Um, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, and uh, the denominator is uh, all the PPE related procurements, uh, which is, was roughly around 900 million. Um, and the, the total number of MWEs, I'm so sorry, I don't have off the top of my head, but I'll try to get it before the end of, of, of okay. this. But we, so, it is more than 10. So just to follow up along with the chair's question, our, our, I believe our citywide goal is 30%, is it not? It is on, it's 30%, uh, yeah, that's correct. So how do we get from 14% uh, of 900 million to $360 million of 1.2 billion? Well, I mean, I, you know, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. Again, I, I think we've said it all there. You know, we were all under sort of rapid fire from March through May, doing the best that we can, trying to get as many, as many vendors in place as we Got could. So, so you'll be some of which were overseas, some of which were not local to New York City. Okay, uh, so, so we will be hearing from an MWB who has faced difficulty in the procurement process and was not selected. I want to acknowledge and thank them for their courage. In the meantime, businesses wishing to contact, contract with the city that are led by women and people of color and ask you to please email contracts at bencalis.com. Who can they email in the administration to assure that they can have help accessing these contracts? So the best go-to is always going to be the office of MWE. They can also reach out to help at mox.nyc.gov. Thank you. And, and I, I, I maintain to this day that I have the assistance email before Mox does, but I think they may have had it first. I want to, uh, so, so uh, Deputy Commissioner, I think you referenced it, but I, I appreciate the fact that at the height of the pandemic, the city of New York took the bold move of becoming an importer of record, taking possession of PPE in foreign nations. But if there's one lesson we should have learned, it's that we need to source PPE locally and that we can use our millions or billions of dollars to do so. Uh, since, I, let's say, July or whatever date you want to use, how much PPE has been, and then even from today moving forward, will be locally and sustainably sourced moving forward, growing jobs right here in New York City? Um, maybe I'll start with that response and then uh, ask EDC to comment as well. I mean, I, I think, um, as, as we said in the testimony, um, the need for medical PPE was uh, vastly more significant than any local production that could occur. Um, we've done everything we can, certainly, to include local production within the stockpile. Um, as I said, I mean, the stockpile is nearly complete at this point, so I wouldn't be able to speculate as to future sourcing. Um, but maybe I'll ask EDC to also comment on what they're doing to support local producers of PPE. Well, I, I guess just if you can share of the N95s in particular, how much of that came from China? Is it 80 percent? Um, and uh, is, is it, uh, or is it 50%? And, and I also just want to take a moment to, to note that we uh, are also joined by council member uh, Robert Cornegie, who is the task force, the MWB task force chair with whom I've also worked on this. So I apologize for omitting him in the long list of people who were interested in the MWB issue. So yes, uh, how many, uh, how much of the N95 supply came from China or another country? Couldn't give you the geographic breakdown uh, off the top, council member. I, I, I will say we've done everything we can in uh, the midst of a very difficult situation for sourcing to diversify sources, you know, both in the city, across the United States, and globally. Uh, and and we've uh, we've been successful at that. I don't have a specific number for you. Oh, maybe DCAS does. Uh, where did our N95 masks come from, and how do we get a local supply? Well, for local supply, I'm going to have to uh, defer to, to EDC on that one. But I, I agree with Jamie. We, we don't have that analysis at this point in time. Anybody else who might have the answer? <clears throat> if, if Mox can try to pull a report, uh, I, I'm hoping that the new passport system has uh, the, the country of origin or at least where our vendors are on the planet. Is that something Mox can pull? Certainly not immediately. We can work with DCAS and go back and, and look at that. The other, I, I would just add for context, 
um, you know, you have a company like 3M who basically had 90% of the N95 market was completely commandeered and, you know, inaccessible to us. And that, um, among other factors, are, are what forced us to, um, to search globally for N95s. Um, it's also, and I'll, you know, Lindsay can jump in, but it is also not um, an easy um, business to get into. Um, it's incredibly uh, heavily regulated, but um, Lindsay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so uh, Council Member Kalos, to answer the first part of your question, um, we ended up spending uh, $111 million uh, with local and a few regional manufacturers to produce 4.2 million isolation gowns, 8.4 million face shields, 1 million test kits, and then 3,000 ventilators, um, creating nearly 3,000 jobs, creating or preserving nearly 3,000 jobs through that work. Um, in terms of uh, how we're thinking about local manufacturing going forward, uh, I think, first of all, uh, everyone should note there is currently a directory of both New York City and regional businesses that make PPE. SBS has been so kind to put that directory together uh, with their uh, council make and the Manufacturing and Industrial Innovation Council. Uh, and so that exists right now as a directory and database of businesses that make PPE and you can search according to what you need. Um, so that's very valuable to have. We're also just thinking about how we can- And, and that address is nyc.gov slash nycbusiness slash article slash, uh, sorry, what, do you have the uh, link? I will look it up for you. I, be, I believe it's make, dot, make something slash reopening supplies, um, but let me get the exact email address and I'll, I'll get it to you um, in the next couple of weeks. You are actually correct. So it's M-A-I-I-C dot N-Y-C slash reopening dash supplies. Thank you. Uh, but I, just to continue, we're also looking at how we can continue the work that we have done over the last several years. We've run a program called FutureWorks, which focuses on advancing innovation and the ability of New Yorkers to invent new things. Uh, and so we want to continue to strengthen and support our manufacturing community through that kind of programming and then work in concert with SBS and their MAKE uh, Council. We're also determining if there is some role for incentives for manufacturers to take advantage of when they are pivoting into medical PPE. So we're exploring that route. Um, and then just specific to the N95 question, we do have a couple of local innovators who have gotten very far in their innovation process in terms of um, the ability to make either an existing design of an N95 or potentially a brand new design. It obviously requires investment if we're going to move forward in that route. And I think we always have to think about this dem demand supply equation um, and what really makes sense. The fact of the matter is um, the N95 marketplace at this point in time is quite firm. It was very soft five months ago. It was very hard to get an N95 and you had to pay um, variable prices. The market has changed a lot because um, there are a lot more uh, N95 factories now uh, in the so, U.S. So I, I'm, I'm quickly running out of my self-imposed time, so I just want to like jump in here into this second wave stockpile. Uh, coming into this hearing, I felt very strongly that the public needed to know how many masks we had. I, I want to thank uh, DDC for sharing that we have 3.5 million N95 masks, 37 million level three isolation gowns, 54 million three-ply surgical gloves, 185 million nitrite gloves, 900,000 goggles, and 6 million face shields. Uh, I guess the my, my big question is just, uh, just to take focus on that, how many of the N95 masks? So these are the stockpile goals. Do we have 3.5 million N95 masks? If not, what is our number? Um, I, first, I, I think it's, it, our target is 13 and a half million uh, N95 masks, uh, council member, yes. um, which is the 90 day supply. And uh, we're, we're pretty confident we'll be at the 90 day supply by the end of the month. What are, what are we as of today, so eight days from the end of the month? I, I don't have the exact number uh, to give you, but as I'm saying, you know, within, within the next, it may slightly broaden that, within the next few weeks, we should be we're comfortable at our, our 90 day supply. I also do want to mention, I mentioned in my testimony, but according to the HERDS data that's reported to the state by the hospitals in the city, New York City hospitals have 23 million N95s. 
So that, that, that is good news. So I guess in your testimony, you mentioned that you're using April as a baseline, but you said millions of N95 masks. So what, how many N95 masks did New York City use in April? I don't have that number uh, exactly at hand. Uh, as I said, we used the April peak to project how much the whole system needed over 90 days and then made sure that we were adjusting based on a more normal utilization. What, so, what was the April peak? I, I don't have that number, Councilman. We'll get back to you. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because I, I, for me, I want to know how did we come up with the 13.5 million and 95 mask number and all the numbers. And so, okay, you use the peak and then were there any other models you used to determine it? Because what I'm hoping is anyone watching at home, our medical professionals who will be testifying later, um, and, and just anyone will be able to say, yes, we've done a great job as a city and we have the right number of masks or that no, we, we need to do better. And, and that's what I think the council's role in government can be. So, so how did you get to 13.5 million? Sure. So as I said, we, we reviewed burn rates reported by hospitals, nursing homes, and other providers during the peak in April. Um, these were reported during a time of severe supply constraint. And so we also used data to give us estimates of expected PPE consumption. Um, we used the calculations from experts, and it was really uh, the health department that led this effort um, about the expected amount of PPE that's needed per bed or per patient. Uh, on a given day and use that to confirm the overall number that we were targeting. And I might ask uh, David Starr from the health department if there's anything more he wants to add about that process that we went through. I'm particularly interested in the model, whether it was an academic model, whether there are health professionals involved in that model and uh, what that model actually is. Dave, did you wanna add something on that? I don't have much to add beyond what what uh, Jamie said. The there we we consulted with various uh, health professionals here in the health department to talk about what he what Jamie said about expected amount of PPE needed per bed or patient encounter in different settings and what the risk of exposure was in those different settings. Um, we used an academic model, but not uh, precisely. We had to we tailored it according to what our experts here in the health department determined was most appropriate for the city. So, so nothing peer reviewed? I'll have to get back to you on that because I wasn't directly involved in the use of that model, but we can get back to you. Okay, th this is something that I provided to uh, the administration ahead of time. I, I did not want to end up in a situation where we didn't have the answer. I think this is the most important question of the hearing, which is just what is our stockpile and how have we determined our 90 day stockpile numbers because lives are riding on it. Uh, along the same lines, you did share a number of the items I did ask questions about. Uh, however, you did not share the number of ventilators we have. Uh, how many ventilators do we have in our stock? I remember reading an article about the fact that we had to, we had basically thrown away ventilators. What is the status of how many ventilators do we have in stock and what will prevent the city from throwing them away in the future? Uh, great. Yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. So um, we have uh, pursued a ventilator stock of our own um, based on a target uh, in the spring. Uh, at its peak, uh, there were about uh, 3,000 patients um, on ventilators in New York City. Our target was to make sure we were able to ventilate at least 6,000 patients in any future resurgence. Um, by just big picture, by the end of the year, um, we expect to have at least 8,500 ventilators in the city. Um, right now, the count is nearly 5,000, and that is from three sources. That's ventilators that have been acquired by the city over the last few months. Uh, it's ventilators that have been sourced from the state and national stockpile, which have been replaced uh, in recent months for higher quality ventilators. And it's also reporting about what the hospitals have in their stock. I should also mention that we have the breathing uh, machines that were produced uh, under EDC's leadership, the Spiros and the BiPAPs. Who, who will these be distributed to? To hospitals. Uh, what, what about nursing homes, congregate, EMS, medical examiners? Um, my understanding is that ventilators are primarily used in so, hospitals. Sorry, I meant for the, for the for the PPE in general. Oh, sure. Yeah. That, so 
you mean just the the overall list of who's uh, who's eligible within the stockpile? It yeah. is a pretty it is a pretty long list of categories. Um, I would just summarize it this way: it's all of the hospitals, nursing homes, uh, adult care facilities, all of our congregate settings, home health agencies. Uh, maybe I'll just read it. Actually, dialysis centers. Uh, emergency medical services and other uniform services, opioid treatment programs, syringe service exchange programs, independent primary care practices, city agencies that are operating within medical settings. Uh, and I should also say that amounts to about a thousand potential recipients who are registered and trained within our system. But if we missed anybody, we're also open to reviewing requests from other sectors. Uh, what about school nurses? home care workers, workers in public schools, workers in public housing. So for any of those workers who are working in a medical setting have been provided with medical PPE. And then there's also what we, we think of as non-medical PPE, it might be cloth face coverings, surgical masks, other types of gloves. Those are also being provided to uh, those workers as necessary. So, so school nurse sitting in a, a room that perhaps if they're lucky has a window that works, child comes in, they think that that child has a uh, coronavirus. Um, will that nurse be able to get an N95 mask from you so that they can do a close and depth person examination the way they need to? Yes, sir. We've distributed N95s through the Department of Education to school nurses. Okay. Uh, we, we, we will hear testimony from a, a group asking about the N95 disposable versus just having a reusable mask. Uh, what is the stock of reusable masks? I'm gonna direct that one to Dave Starr from the health department. Um, the current st the stockpile as it's situated now does not contain reusable masks and there are very good reasons for that. While we support the use of reusable masks, um, reusable PPE in healthcare facilities, it's a not, it's not that simple. So my, like N95s to use a reusable mask effectively, you have to go through medical evaluation, a respiratory protection program where you receive medical evaluation to find out if you're able to wear the mask uh, safely and then go through a fit testing program to make sure that it actually fits your face and can protect you effectively. So, and with the reusable, it has more, uh, there are more issues around uh, disinfection after each use and things like that. So that's part of a whole protocol that each facility would have to develop on their own. And we didn't feel it was appropriate to put something that was so specialized by facility in the stockpile because of the cost of those items, as well as the fact that they would only be available, they would only be effective for a very small part of the recipients or the, the, the intended, intended recipients of the stockpile. So the stockpile is really built to, to serve the, broad, the healthcare sector broadly, and that would be spending a significant quantity of money to serve a very tiny sliver of the healthcare system. That said, we do support the use of uh, the acquisition and use of those in, in specific facilities, of course. Would you be willing to, again, we don't want specific facilities bidding against each other. Would you be willing to work with specific folks representing workers who would qualify and could use these materials? Uh, and and so, so I guess, are you willing to work with uh, folks to help procure these reusable devices uh, and, and implement them in specific H plus H and other settings? Certainly. Yeah. That's, we, that's great news. Uh, yeah. Last question, and I don't have a second round at this point, and uh, I'll, I'll pass that on to my colleagues who do have questions. So my, my final question is, if I'm a city employee or I represent a group of city employees and um, listen, if, if, it, if it's me, if it was my loved one, um, some people don't wanna wear an N95 mask, they're happy with the cloth mask because it's much more comfortable. But listen, if you, if you wanna bring things as close to zero, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the least risk is, uh, to just have an N95 mask. If city employees don't necessarily feel safe and do want an N95 mask, who's, who's the ultimate, or ultimate arbitrator now that we're no longer in a situation where there's not enough of anything of who can get an N95 mask if they might be uh, compromised or be an at-risk group that still is being told to go to work in person? Um. Dave, do you want to just speak to the appropriate uses of the N95 mask? And then I'll, I'll answer a little more generally. Sure. Um, 
we really, I mean, when we're thinking about the stockpile and the, and the efforts that we've made, we're really focusing on medical situations. So the stockpile is really dedicated for medical personnel who are at risk. Um, N95s, uh, like I described with the reusable PPE, the reusable respirators, you do have, you know, the you need a respiratory control, a respiratory protection program in a facility that can adequately fit test, medical, you know, clear them medically for I'm the just use of the respirator. About the N95 masks in general. What I'm what I'm getting at is that if a, if you're wearing an ill-fitting N95 mask that you have not been fit tested on, it's not much more protection than a surgical surgical mask, if any at all. Um, if uh, people would like to access N95s from like a Home Depot or something like that to make them feel more comfortable, that's certainly uh, an option they can take advantage of. Right, right, but but just to be, I mean, N95s need to be fit tested to be effective. To be effective, has, right. That has to be done in a clinical setting where there's expertise, um, which is why N95s are deployed in medical settings. I, I would also say more generally, council member, I mean, if, if I mean, we, we are doing everything we can as a city across all agencies to make sure that our city workers have the appropriate PPE. And if there's any uh, city employee that has a concern, they do, they should talk to their health and safety office within their agency. Um, but the we... big, big question is since the pandemic began, we went from no masks to six feet of space and social distancing to masks plus that. And then we started to learn about the fact that there could be airborne droplets and uh, the question is, if you are a, a municipal worker working in H plus H and you're being told to go into that room with somebody who is Corona, who is COVID-19 positive, uh, where, where there may be droplets, where we don't know what the air circulation necessarily might be in all of our facilities, go in, clean up everything, wipe down the bed, make sure that the person's okay, wipe, do your job. Uh, is that a person who can access N95 masks if they want to? If that fits with the facility's uh, respiratory protection program, then yes. Okay, that's the end of my questions. We'll be hearing from some of the labor leaders uh, who represent a lot of these groups, and I hope that somebody from the administration will stay. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Rosenthal, Barron, Joe Nye, and Cornegy. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, uh, Alex, uh, from uh, my committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. Uh, as the chair said, first we will hear from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Barron, and then Councilmember Jonai. Councilmember Rosenthal, you may begin as soon as the chair announces the time. Time starts now. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? I'm multi-zooming, um, so I've been a little distracted, and I apologize if these questions have already been asked. Um, most of them follow up with Councilmember Kalos's questions. Um, I'm wondering uh, if we could go back to the DOI commissioner. I'm wondering, uh, and then also maybe Dan Simon knows about this. Do you know if you if the city paid for anything that we did not receive, um, like the one that the commissioner seemed to note that she was investigating? So, I mean, I'm going to, I'll, I'll let Dan or DCAS follow up on that. What, what we, the, uh, in the active investigations that we have, I would say for merchandise, I'm not aware of anything that we're currently investigating that we prepaid for and didn't receive. Um, we do have some investigations into um, people accessing certain services the city was providing in which money was expended that did not go to the right people. So I, I, I can't provide more detail about that, but we do have some investigations of that nature that are active right now. So in other words, it's sort of a subcontract. So reimbursement, an invoice was given to the city, the city reimbursed, and then you're looking at the subcontractors. Right, or in the case of services where 
um, the city was paying for services that were intended only for certain populations and bad actors sort of took advantage of those services that they weren't entitled to receive. Sure. Um, so what I would total, make that a second category. Thank you. What's the total value of those types of investigations? Oh, she's been muted. <laughs> okay, I think I think I'm back. Um, I, I don't have the exact figure, and I think with some of those investigations that are ongoing, it's hard to put a dollar amount on them right now, particularly in the services side. Um, certainly, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would say, on the services side potentially. Um, on the good side, as I said, our investigations on the provision of good side very. Very few, if any, of those are a prepayment situation. Um, but so in other words, they, they're not ones where the city paid in advance and didn't get. Right. And, and for the ones where, I guess, on services, do you have clawback provisions in the contracts? Oh, my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I honestly think I'm doing that. I'm so conditioned on Zoom to, to mute myself when I'm not talking. Um, so on the services side, uh, those some of those contracts have clawback provisions, and also um, where the not. Are, uh, I'm, I'm wondering why wouldn't all have? Why wouldn't that be a standard line in a city contract to have a clawback provision? I'm going to defer to Dan um, Simons on that. Yeah. Hi, Councilman Rosenthal. Um, good to see you. Uh, yeah, uh, Mercedes can give the specific details around. Um, what we prepaid for and uh, the very, very few items uh, uh, that we didn't get back and and, and the and, and what's at risk, uh, the, the, the value of the funds at risk. Um, but I will just tell you that uh, back in the spring, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, it was a seller's market and um, we were, the city almost never pays upfront for anything. Yeah. In fact, it never happened before in my career. Yeah. Um, but we were we were forced to take that uh, that measure. But Mercedes, go ahead if you want to. Well, unfortunately, I only have a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, so sorry. I'd appreciate your getting back to the committee staff sure sure on thing. the dollar value. Sure thing. Um, and on if there were any contracts that didn't have callback provisions. Also, I'm wondering, Dan, why um, passport. Uh, doesn't connect with the controller's office. It would seem that that's, you know, just regular payment, that that would make sense. And my second question, in case I get up, cut off, is um, how many emergency contracts has the controller been able to audit? And has he found anything? Has anything bubbled out of those audits? Sure, thanks. Uh, so uh, because this got kicked up in March, right? We didn't have release three of Passport, which we've talked a lot about. Um, it Time expired. It didn't go live until June. Um, and so that capability of uh, doing any kind of contract management went live in June. And so all of these emergency purchase orders and contracts are in the, the older system that we're replacing. And so that's, this, so that's why they're stuck in this uh, manual process. So um, if they were, if they had a contract today, they, it would just flow right through the invoice, for example, would flow right through from passport to the controller's office to cut a check. Invoicing, invoicing is coming in release four. And so that'll be in 2021. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But release three is a huge release that we just went live with in June. And we're very excited about it. And we have built an interface. Uh, with the controller's office. In fact, uh, the first few contracts went through just in the past week or so. Okay, and I really want to defer to my colleagues. So if you could get back to the committee to have the answer on how many of the contracts has the controller's office audited of the total and has, has the controller identified anything? Sure thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Barron, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Councilmember Barron, you may begin when Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you to the chairs for calling this hearing, and thank you to the panels for coming and sharing the information with us. Uh, 
as uh, my colleague council member Rosenthal has indicated, we're bouncing back and forth between other hearings and I apologize if this information is duplicative of what you've already answered. But I would like to know the amount that's been awarded through these contracts for each of the items that are under the PPE, the N95 cloth, mask, gowns, gloves, and face shields. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, council member Perrin. Sorry about that. Good to see you. Um, we mentioned at the outset of the hearing that the total tally is uh, about $900 million at this point right. um, has been spent on that PPE. I don't have the specific breakdown by those different categories. These were bulk purchases where with some contracts and deliveries, we were getting multiple items in the same delivery. So we'd have to do a little bit of work, I think, to break that down unless uh, unless Dan or Mercita corrects me. Um, no, but we're, right. happy, we're happy to do that that's to get right. you that information. Uh, I'm disappointed that you don't have that. It would, I think, help us to see where the bulk of the money has gone. I understand that you say that it's a bulk delivery, bulk mm -hmm. purchases, but I think it should be able to have been disaggregated simply by the contract that was posed in itself. So I would love to get that information. So then that then brings me to my second question, which you won't be able to answer, which is of those contracts that were awarded in each of the categories for PPE, how many contracts went specifically to black companies? We know we're in this age now, we're talking about the systemic injustices that blacks have endured uh, systemically from this beginning of this country. And we would like to know how we're addressing that. And when blacks get lumped into WMBE categories, it sometimes masks the inequity still that black companies are facing. So I would like to have that information uh, once you get the disaggregation for the uh, awards that were given. And you talk about stockpiles and I've heard you say that um, the stockpiles are for medical personnel for a period of 90 days. So are we hearing now that what you have stockpiled and the quantities that you have described will be sent to or able to be distributed to those uh, medical facilities only. And you did have a list of what's on the, uh, of, of the entities on that list. So are those the only ones that will receive these equipment? Um, uh, I make a couple points for you there. Um, and, and thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically the goal is for this type of PPE to, for anything happening in a medical setting to be able to provide it to those healthcare workers. Um, and so, you know, that's, there was a long list of different types of organizations where medical uh, work is happening. If we missed anybody um, through all our outreach, uh, and I mentioned that we have more than a thousand uh, entities signed up, and we're happy to talk about adding them. I will also say we do have a supply of non-medical PPE, uh, mm -hmm. things like face coverings, uh, gloves, and so on. And the city's been, uh, that's, uh, that's a, uh, with DCAS and the city's been uh, deploying that in whatever case that it's needed. So would, I did hear you reference or someone referenced previously that NYCHA did receive some of these uh, PPE equipment, particularly in terms of the face uh, coverings. Are they a part of this consideration so that again, NYCHA can expect to receive these kinds of equipment? Yeah, if a city agency needs medical PPE, they're getting it from the stockpile. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and uh, two more questions. I have to talk quickly. Um, as you were selecting contractors, did you have a cap on the amount that you would be willing to negotiate to pay for any of the particular items? Or was it just, listen, we need it and we're gonna pay whatever we're being asked to pay? And what outreach was done particularly to black businesses to let them know how they might take advantage of this opportunity to be able to provide services, even if it meant shifting the products that they were presently producing. You mentioned uh, museums gave, uh, and also one of the beer companies uh, shifted and pre presented that to the city. So were there businesses, was there outreach done so that they would know, listen, I may be able to modify- Time expired. Modify Thank you, production line and bring this out. And what was that outreach done uh, in that regard? And was there a cap 
on what you would pay for the equipment. Dan, do you want to respond on the 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 pricing, and then I think uh, probably Lindsay would be best to respond on on local production. Sure. Uh, so, uh, as you can imagine, the 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 prices were um, uh, extremely volatile uh, back in the spring, um, but we uh, did what we could to uh, analyze the market in real time and only pay reasonable prices. But we did not have any cap. Um, but we, we certainly paid a higher price than what uh, those items were costing pre-COVID. Okay. Council Member Barron, I'm happy to answer on behalf of EDC because of the local sourcing focus that we had. Um, let me just preface by saying, um, obviously, uh, it's so important to focus on supporting and strengthening MWBEs, um, particularly when we look at economic recovery. Um, EDC prioritizes MWBE selection. We exceeded our target last year as an organization and agency. Um, and we're thinking about raising our target for the year ahead. So just something to be aware of. It's definitely a high priority for us. In terms of the local sourcing operation, if you look across the over 130 factories or sub factories or companies that we ended up sourcing from or sourcing through, about 40% of those were owned by a woman or minority entrepreneur. I don't have exact numbers for um, black entrepreneurs, uh, but um, but yeah, that was that was our rate. In terms of outreach, you know, we had a link on our site that was it functioned as our intake form for anyone to be able to raise their hand and say, "I have PPE. I would like to provide it to the city." And we had an MWBE checkbox on our form so that we could easily determine um, who fit that categorization. Um, but I should caveat and say that the kinds of companies that were supplying to the city that were often fashion manufacturers, for example, who maybe had participated in city procurement before, they wouldn't necessarily have been certified as an MWBE. So it's just something to keep in mind. Thank you so much. And to the chairs, uh, Valone, Kalos, and Cabrera, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Next, we will hear from Council Member Joni. As a Time starts now. As a reminder to the remaining Council members, please use the Zoom raise hand function if you still have a question. So I want to thank the chairs um, and most of my questions uh, were already raised and I want to thank uh, Kalos for honing in on some of those. My question is, is the executive order suspending the city's procurement laws still in effect due to the state of the emergency? Yes, it is, council member. What is the purpose now that we've had a moment to catch our breath um, and I guess refocus? Why are we still operating under the suspension of the city's procurement laws when we now have the ability to shop differently and uh, comply with those laws that you have a stockpile at hand? So council member, uh, the executive order is not just for PPE procurement. Um, there, are, as you can imagine, there are emerging needs um, as it relates to COVID. And so it's, uh, it's not just uh, PPE that this is applicable to. So um, as I said, the mayor um, is using every tool at his disposal to protect New Yorkers and will continue to do so until, uh, until it's not needed. Well, thank you, Dan. That's great. But this is an opportunity for us to comply with, with the procurement laws. Obviously, the pressure is off of us, uh, and if we can do that with PPE and this new world that we live in, and PPE is going to, is going to continue, the demand will continue for some time to come, and it's a new way of life. The sooner we start complying with those procurement laws and the acquisition of products and services, the better off we are. And I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. Do you agree? Sure, I would just say that the, the law is suspended, so it's not like we're not complying with the law. In fact, we are mimicking the processes that um, would be in place uh, to, a, to a large degree. Um, and we've taken, we've gone to great lengths to, to ensure that there is rigor and the process um, and transparency. Um, so, but I, but I take your point, we take no comfort in the fact that uh, the, the laws have been suspended um, at all. Um, and I look forward to as much as you do to having our procurement laws uh, back in effect. 
Thank you. So my next question is, what is the number of uh, disposable masks that we currently have at hand and how much more do you believe will be required of us to have at hand in the future, uh, especially in light of the second, the threat of a second wave? Um, right. Thanks, Council Member. I, I guess that, so there are two different categories there, um, but our, I'll give you our 90-day stockpile targets um, for N95 respirator masks. Uh, 13 and a half million. And then uh, our target for three pi surgical masks uh, is 54 million. And have you acquired all of that already? You have that in place? We're very close uh, in, in all categories. Um, Can I also suggest then that we, I, I put a bill in uh, an LS request that government stop purchasing um, disposable masks, especially when it's not uh, for essential workers. Uh, we're giving out a tremendous amount of masks. We should actually be looking into reusable, washable cloth masks. And even the CDC now has suggested uh, that we start using more renew uh, reusable masks. Why aren't we focused on this? It would be obviously in the long run, it would cost the taxpayer dollars less. Uh, we would be able to uh, protect Mother Earth, and from an environmental conscious point of view, it's the right thing to do. Stop filling our landfills and uh, giving uh, give everyone an opportunity to reuse masks, and we know that this is going to be a new way of life. Can anyone answer why we're still acquiring disposable masks when it's non-essential, when it doesn't fit the category of non-essential non workers? Yeah, it's, Council Member, I, I guess it, the to the last point you made, this is really for essential workers. I, I will say that we, we do have a supply of reusable cloth masks. And in fact, mentioned earlier, um, we've been able to distribute about 7 million of those to nonprofits across the city that are distributing them to folks. This is uh, the, the uh, surgical masks that we're talking about are for use in a healthcare setting, in a medical setting. I think the EDC has been given that mass uh, as well throughout the city. Uh, uh, all New Yorkers to making sure they protect themselves. So I only got 20 seconds, but I want to ask my next question. And obviously one of the services that you are honing in on is COVID testing. Um, rather than COVID testing, why aren't we using antibody testing to determine who has had COVID? So we can come up with two categories, uh, those that have been exposed to it and the unlikelihood that they expired. catch it again or be exposed to it again. So we can focus on those that have not contracted the disease uh, or this virus, and then start focusing on those that are vulnerable with underlying health conditions or the elderly. So we can start getting a very proactive approach. Uh, and I would hope that there'll be a movement for this versus the continuous retesting. Uh, and we know that the, in, the, the findings of the COVID test are only good up until the date that you've taken the test. And uh, going back for a repeat test weekly is going to cost taxpayers more money and ultimately not yield the result that we need. Uh, and this will also be very helpful to us in the time of a vaccine, which we hope is around the corner, giving it to those that have not had or prioritizing the vaccine for those that have not had the virus. Can anyone answer? And my time is up. I, I uh, Council Member, I want to thank you for that. We'll certainly make sure that we uh, get that feedback. We don't have the our test and trace uh, operation here for this hearing today, so they're the right ones to answer that question. They can follow up, but thank you. Chairs, uh, I would hope that we would revisit that question as we start looking at uh, what we can do in a proactive manner. I'm a big supporter of the antibody test versus just the COVID test. Let's figure out the two categories. The sooner we know, who's had it versus who hasn't been exposed to the virus, the better we can come up with a plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Joni. I'll now turn it back to Chair Kalos for any further questions. I'm gonna just ask a uh, quick off topic question to uh, Margaret Garnett at DOI. Uh, each month I open my office to meet face-to-face -face with residents. Now we do it over Zoom. It's called First Fridays. Anyone's welcome to join. Uh, this month, multiple residents brought up questions and concern uh, regarding alleged corruption at the Department of Investigations and a perceived failure to investigate certain complaints. Uh, there are even instances of federal litigation around this, but I'm not wanna, I don't want to ask about that. So uh, 
with regards to anyone who has concerns about alleged corruption at DOI, uh, what what can what what should the city council be doing about it, and, and what can you, as the head of DOI, do about it? So we we investigate every complaint we receive, even the ones that are about ourselves. Um, I my general counsel uh, Leslie Dubeck is the IG for DOI, so. Um, she conducts internal investigations that relate to complaints about DOI. Um, if, if a complaint is about me, I'm obviously recused from that and, and we would take other measures to make sure that it is investigated without conflict. So I, I don't know the specifics of what you're asking about. I'm happy to talk to you about that online, but we do have a process within DOI um, to make sure that even if the complaints are about us, that they're investigated with the same rigor that we would apply to any other city agency. Right. So as a mandatory reporter myself, if it is a complaint about DOI, I can either uh, bring it to you or your general counsel and there's a procedure moving forward? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. That's my question. Over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much. I, I have one question because I know uh, the chairs want to move forward uh, and we have more panelists. But I, I wanted to get a picture of at what point do you feel that our PPE safety net uh, will be vulnerable, uh, would uh, be overwhelmed? Uh, what's the case scenario that you see that we, are, we wouldn't be prepared for a second surge, uh, if I could use the word tsunami in this pandemic, uh, that it will be overwhelming? You will overwhelm the system. Yeah, th thanks for the question, Council Member. I mean, that, that's certainly, um, that's been the driving concern for us, uh, you know, and, and uh, under the mayor's direction uh, to build a 90-day stockpile. Um, it was all about that. And I can say that we, uh, one agency that's not with us today is the uh, New York City Emergency Management, but we've been doing uh, tabletop exercises other preparation exercises um, where, you know, we all work within scenarios. And I can say that that happens at the highest levels of the administration uh, on a constant basis. And that's been the basis for the planning assumption um, that we have stockpiled 90 days worth of PPE. Uh, also, as I've mentioned, we're seeing reporting that hospitals and nursing homes are complying with that executive order. Um, so, you know, you just in, in one hypothetical example of a hospital has 90 days of PPE and we have 90 days of PPE that gives us six months of a, I'm, I'm not saying we're going to have this, but six months of a surge like in April. And during that six months, we would certainly be able to source more PPE. So that's what gives us a lot of confidence about these numbers. Right. Uh... All right, uh, let me give it back to council member, uh, to the chairs, uh, Chair Kalos. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the council members who stayed through uh, a very long uh, beginning of the hearing. There are outstanding questions for the administration. I'm gonna check in with Mercita if she got me any of those numbers by the end of our questioning. Did we lose Mercita? No, I was just muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. So on uh, Woodhull, who is a city certified MWE, uh, we uh, ended up paying them $500,000 for the mass that they delivered. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I know that uh, Councilmember Rosenthal has outstanding questions and we hope to get those back. And I will now uh, thank, uh, excuse the administrative panel. Thank you. Uh, please make sure to respond to any follow-ups. <laughs> Uh, we, we now have uh, multiple panels. Uh, we're not really doing panels anymore, but just in terms of groups of folks. So we're, we're prioritizing folks who are uh, working on specific front lines in medical situations. So uh, we should hear from uh, New York State Nurses Association's Doctors Council, CWA 1180 DC 37 Local 420 in a first, in a first grouping. Uh, we will also hear from our uh, workers uh, who are essential workers at DC 37, local 372, uh, and as well as SEIU 33PJ. Our uh, next group will hear from Human Service Council, Anti-Defamation League, and MWBE. 
as well as a final panel of uh, doctors and uh, members of the community. Thank I'll you very much. Back over to the moderator. Just want to thank you, council members, for the opportunity to talk about this. Yeah, thank and thank you very you much for holding this hearing. For that, that was a very detailed, almost three hours. So we thank you for all the information, and we will follow up, just like Chair King. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given five minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist or a group of panelists should use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you in the order that you raised your hand once the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Judy Sheridan Gonzalez to testify. After Ms. Sheridan Gonzalez, we will hear from Kevin Collins, followed by Sean D. Francois. Ms. I'm Sheridan Gonzalez, please begin once the sergeant starts the timer. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Judy Sheridan Gonzalez, an emergency room RN and president of the New York State Nurses Association, largest RN union in New York, representing over 42,000. Uh, frontline health work care workers went into battle last spring, lacking the tools needed to provide care for our patients while keeping ourselves, coworkers, families, and communities safe from the virus. I know this because I was there. My hospital in the Bronx was completely overwhelmed by the sick and dying during New York's COVID-19 surge in the spring. We don't ask firefighters to run into burning buildings without proper equipment and safety gear, but that's exactly what we were subjected, what we subjected bedside health care workers to. While we won some improvements, what we got was far short of proper protection. N95s designed to be discarded after every patient interaction were rationed to one per week, even two weeks, then cleaned and reused. We had to fight for the right to wear one, N one new N95 per 12 hour shift, not a universal win, but this same mask was worn between many patients, allowing for cross infection and resulting in brutal uh, facial scarring. Uh, just to show you what that looked like. For those of you who have video, this is what the facial scarring looked like. Um, previously, using an N95 resulted in worker discipline for an infection control violation. NISA and other unions sounded the alarm about the acute shortages of PPE, demanding federal action to invoke the Defense Production Act. Sadly, those calls fell on deaf ears at the federal level. At the state level, efforts to obtain PPE were haphazard and often ineffective, in spite of best intentions. Supplies were inadequate. Some N95s were counterfeit or expired. There was no clarity that defined sufficiency of PPE. The state frequently implied that PPE distribution was adequate, but these assertions were based on inaccurate information provided by facilities and so-called scarcity standards which are protocols relying on extended use and reuse of disposable equipment in violation of all medical and scientific standards. It was tantamount to reusing a condom. Picture that for a moment. Another problem, these inadequate PPE supplies were also unfairly distributed within the healthcare system. Some facilities leveraged better connections and had financial resources to obtain supplies. But meanwhile, safety net hospitals like my own Public New York City health and hospital system, long-term care and home care had much greater difficulty and fewer PPE supplies. Some had none at all. No surprise, these facilities largely serve black and brown communities and our most vulnerable New Yorkers. While a number of governmental and nonprofit agencies, the city of New York, even individual fundraisers tried to step in to alleviate PPE shortages, there were few steps taken towards expanding the range of respirators available and no sustained encouragement of local production of PPE. As a result, thousands of us became ill and many died of COVID-19, even while we struggled to save the lives of our patients. Effective emergency management requires us to take what was learned during COVID round one and use it to be better prepared for round two and beyond. One solution is to expand the array of respirators available, especially those non-disposable designed to be worn for extended periods and safely clean. And that's where elastomeric respirators come in. And I have a picture of that respirator for you, that's what it looks like. Um, they fit better, they reduce facial scarring, and they better control moisture. You've all experienced the buildup of nasal secretions in your simple mask. Imagine a nurse wearing a tight-fitting N95 for 12 hours, 
what it would look like, providing a, a pool, a pool for virus to proliferate. Finally, with the increase in prices of N95s during the COVID crisis, elastomerics makes much more sense financially. Every elastomeric respirator used eliminates the need for hundreds and thousands of N95s. If each facility in the city replaced some portion of their N95s with these reusable respirators, the need to purchase N95s still in short supply during future viral surges, and one is looming right now, would be vastly reduced. According to a recent article in the journal the American College of Surgeons, elastic respirators cost 10 times less per month than disinfecting and reusing disposable N95s. Incorporating elastomerics could, elastomerics could provide additional opportunities for sourcing equipment locally, bolstering our fragile economy. Some New York firms use equipment and production methods akin to those needed for such production of elastomerics. Others could be retooled and supported to do so, providing desperately needed jobs and promoting industrial development. Recently, NIOSH recognized the importance of elastomeric equipment, creating a program to distribute a couple hundred thousand of them free of charge to facilities willing to evaluate their use. Many facilities throughout the country already incorporate them into their programs, including Brookdale, Interface, Kingsbrook, and Brooklyn Hospital Center right here in New York City. If they can do it, why not others? This is a time to follow the science, follow NIOSH lead. We need to get elastomerics into all stockpiles, state, city, facilities, large and small. Let's hothouse PP production right here in our own state. I'm expired. City. If we don't, it'll be deja vu. We're committed to make it happen. As Councilman Torres Springer said, we're always looking to add further rigor to our procurement process. Please ensure that these safer, most cost-effective respirators are made available, create jobs for New Yorkers, be fiscally responsible, provide superior reliable products that will save the lives of patients and caregivers. Thank you for allowing us to testify. Thank you, Ms. Sheridan Gonzalez. Next, we will hear from Kevin Collins, followed by Carmen Charles, followed by Sean Francois. Mr. Collins, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Kalos, Cabrera, and Ballone. Thanks for the opportunity to testify before you and the other members of the committees today, and I hope each of you and your families are safe and well. I'm Kevin Collins, Executive Director of Doctors Council SEIU. We're the Union for Physicians and Dentists and represent doctors in New York and different states. Um, as today's hearing deals with COVID-19 pandemic and PPE, personal protective equipment, I think it's appropriate that we all reflect on those who have lost their lives due to the coronavirus, who have been impacted by the loss of a loved one, lost their jobs, otherwise negatively hurt. Let's never forget those. I also want to lift up all the members of Doctors Council, SEIU, who've worked and continue to practice during the COVID pandemic, who may be called on to do so with future waves or other pandemics, and also the other members of the patient care team with nurses and techs and housekeepers, and all the union members that have kept New York City going. Today deals with a couple of topics. With respect to intro 1980, establishing the special investigator to review contracts, we were in favor of this. Due to the serious impact of the COVID uh, crisis and future possible ways, anything we can learn from what we went through is needed as well as having transparency in what occurred. For example, the, the current method of the supply chain for PPE for hospitals and health systems is ridiculous as we recently witnessed inadequate to handle emergencies. Even health systems that may have had PP orders made in late 19 or early 20 may have seen these orders rerouted or used elsewhere. Further, there must be standards protocols in place to ensure that the PPE that does reach frontline doctors and other healthcare workers are in compliance with appropriate regulatory and safety standards. There have been suppliers of PPE that have sent supplies that were not proper and could do harm to the doctor and patient through the spreading of illness or injury. PPE encompasses more than N95 masks, such as surgical masks, gloves, face shields, goggles, head and shoe covers, et cetera, that protect against the transmission of germs through contact and droplet uh, uh, routes. If you think of the doctors and other healthcare workers as soldiers in the war against the virus, we must give them the tools and weapons to fight the virus. Otherwise they will become infected and end up as patients and potentially spread the virus to others. Further, as PPE contracts impact the lives and health and safety of healthcare workers and patients, they should be A, on the health system website and B, reported to appropriate government agency review and also to be available for public view. The government agency should review that the contracts are safe and secure and that one health system, one health system does not have lower standards than another. There must be a delineated uh, set of standards for all. Everyone deserves this and no less. Communities of color and those in lower income neighborhoods suffered the impact of COVID far worse than others. Ensuring common standards of purchasing a PPE is one way of balancing the field and addressing inequality. As to securing PPE for the next wave or the next pandemic, we must seek the highest common denominator and not the lowest. 
What I mean by that is during the height of the first wave, the CDC and the state DOH and various health systems that follow their guidance would have various protocols such as 14 days of quarantine that became seven days, that then became 72 hours of symptom and fever free. PPE protocols similarly seem to be on a race to the bottom of the lowest common denominator. N95 masks that should be discarded after a procedure and should not be more than one day were now to be worn for five days. Established medical protocols were ignored and kept changing largely because of lack of supplies. This is not necessarily to blame any individual hospital health system, for as I noted earlier, the supply chain in our country is poorly designed and implemented. Hospitals should not have to compete with each other for PPE supplies, nor we should not have to rely upon sports team owners or players to de deliver desperately needed supplies. However, inasmuch as what we went through shows a lack of leadership from the federal government to use the Defense Production Act, local, state, cities, and hospitals were unprepared. We must maintain the highest standard of infection protocol and reinstate longstanding CDC guidelines regarding the use of PPE and, and protecting against infectious disease cases. There is a proper way to use PPE, including N95 masks. Using surge capacity or the pandemic as a justification when a sudden increase in patient volume occurs is a poor excuse to put the health and safety of workers and patients at risk. Trying to extend the use of PPE beyond safe usage rates or burn rates is placing healthcare workers and public at unnecessary risk. During the first wave, it was noted that the various health systems in New York were to combine and act as one. The degree of that success may be debatable, but if indeed hospitals are to work together as one regarding pandemics, then there should be one high standard for safe and secure usage of PPE. As of September 30th, hospitals would have at least 90 days PPE on hand with, to be in com compliance with the New York State requirements. Key concept here that if this is based on the daily baseline burn rate of the average usage for the period of April 13th to the 27th, but if the PPE was being pro improperly being extended and used during this time, such as N95 masks being used for five days as opposed to one day, or being changed after each procedure, then this data will be faulty and perpetuate a shortage and improper use. Second, if time expired. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up. Second, if healthcare workers were intimidated or afraid to ask for more uh, or new PPE or simply gave up, then a similar problems exist. Whether it should be 90 days or 120, 80 days in the uh, stockpile has to be dependent upon uh, the use of the supply chain. And we agree with uh, the vetting in advance, not as it occurs, not after the fact, the vetting in advance of potential local businesses and vendors um, for, for the proper use of their contracts and review. Um, a lot of hospitals guarded the, the uh, giving out of PPE and healthcare workers had a tough time getting them. There should really only be one standard. Whenever a doctor or other healthcare worker believes that an N95 mask or other PPE is needed, they should be given that PPE. Uh, the, the ability of healthcare workers to speak up is very important. And that's why we have supported the city council legislation on protecting healthcare workers' rights to speak out in such uh, situations. My comments today have focused largely about PPE, but this also can be applied to ventilators and other medical equipment, such as medications for patients. Um, lastly, it's our hope that by learning from what we went through um, and working with the city council and others, that we'll all be better prepared for when the next wave or pandemic occurs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and doctor's council is always available to work with each of you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. We will next hear from Carmen Charles, followed by Sean DeFrancois, followed by Donald Nesbitt. Carmen Charles, you may begin when the Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Ms. Charles, are you still muted? Looks like Carmen Charles is having some technical difficulties, so uh, we'll try to come back to her. Uh, for this next panelist, why don't we move to Sean DeFrancois, followed by Donald Nesbitt, and we'll try to return to Carmen Charles when she sorts out the technical difficulties. Mr. DeFrancois, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Looks like he's gone as well. Okay, apologies. Uh, Mr. Nesbitt, if you're prepared, um, we can move to you. Uh, so with the muter, please unmute Donald Nesbitt and then he can begin when the Sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilman Kalos, uh, 
Councilman uh, Vallone and Councilman uh, Cabrera, and the distinguished members of the New York City Council. I'm Donald Nesbitt, Executive Vice President for Local 372, the New York City Board of Education employees out of District Council 37, um, ASME. I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the approximate 24,000 members of Local 372, which represents, uh, which I represent, and under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois I. First. first, I wanna give an applause to all essential workers, especially those who are represented by Local 372, who have risked their own health and safety to perform vital services to the community throughout the last seven months. Through the school system, though the, though the school system was closed throughout much of the pandemic, nearly 9,000 school lunch employees and 2,600 school crossing guards remained on the job as the city was shut down. School crossing guards remain uh, diligent, vigilant um, to ensure that children and pedestrians um, cross the street safely in the morning and afternoons in their communities. School lunchroom employees continue to unload, prepare, and serve food every day throughout this pandemic. They fed students, they provided food security to members of the community. Since the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, over 200 million meals have been prepared and served to students, their families, and adults and members of the community. These workers continue to be placed in harm's way at risk of exposure to then the exploding pandemic because their responsibilities play an essential role in keeping the wheels of society turning as our city combated the virus. And now with schools reopen, all local 372 members must assume this risk every day to ensure 1.2 million public school children of the New York City will be learning ready. For example, the school crossing guards the school lunchroom workers, the school aides are with students all throughout the day. Various community titles like parent coordinators, um, community coordinators, um, and our community assistants work with parents to navigate the Department of Education. Our substance abuse prevention and intervention specialists, SAPIS, work with students in mental health in the prevention of substance abuse, gun violence, and anti-bullying. All well as gang prevention and mediation. Family workers are also navigating the school system, but not only the school system, all, also the children that are in temporary housing. The future that our education provides for, for a child is one of the most important obligations society must fulfill. And that is why tens of thousands of local 372 members continue to go to work and face the threats of exposure and infection. However, though always on the front lines, local 372 members are not always treated like essential workers that they are. That is why these workers need more than just an applause. These workers need access to assistance, benefits, and protections that help them to continue safely working through the state of emergency. Local 372 has been appreciative of the assistance that our members have to have received, but this was after us having to purchase masks for our members um, out of the union's expenses. Um, now and in the future, uh, protection, the protections that are needed are clear. These pandemic scenarios, these workers need adequate timely and timely and accessible supply of PPE, including masks and gloves, to mitigate the risk of transmission to, to the extent that a special prosecutor can shed light to highlight existing efficiencies and possible improvements to the emergency contract procurement process to further protect our members in the future, Local 372 will be very supportive. In addition, the, the city should also provide hazard pay as um, contemplated in intro 1918 to appropriately compensate our essential workers for the sacrifice that they have made. And when Local 372 and our students now back on location, it is extremely important that all of our schools are cleaned regularly with routine testing um, implemented to spot the virus before it can spread. We are very diligent in these efforts. Um, however, more support must be provided for the city, from the city. Especially now with- Time expired. 
I'll be wrapping up now, especially now with cases um, and clusters rising up, it is imperative that the city actively maintain vigilance alongside us in order for schools to remain a safe place to learn and work and to prevent a return to the worst days of this pandemic. On behalf of the 24,000 members of Local 372, New York City Board of Education um, employees, District Council 37 asked me, I thank you for this opportunity to testify and uh, I'll be here to answer any questions later. Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, next, we will try again to hear from Carmen Charles, followed by Charmaine Lathan, followed by Yin Lin. Carmen Charles, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman uh, Kalos, Ballone, Cabrera, and the rest of the committee members on contract and economic development and government operations. My name is Carmen Charles. I am the president of Local 420 Ask Me. I represent municipal workers within um, health and hospitals. Local 420 would like to recognize the dedication of all frontline workers and thank them for their service and sacrifice. We dedicate this testimony to the 15 members of Local 420 who passed away fighting this dreadful, awful pandemic and those who continue to serve today. New York City has become the national model for containing coronavirus. Because of the hard work and sacrifices of the frontline workers, all frontline workers are heroes and deserve to be treated as such. If Congress is listening, it is long past, long time overdue to make the Heroes Act the law of the land. It is the least that can be that you can do, considering what frontline workers have faced and continue to face, because Washington, D.C. botched the response to COVID-19. Local 420 represents more than 8,700 members across 11 acute care hospitals, five long-term care facilities, five diagnostic centers, and dozens of clinics across New York City. Along with the technician and aides employed at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, Fire Department, and the Department of Correction. In all of my years within the healthcare profession, I never could have imagined encountering something as insidious as COVID-19. At the onset of the pandemic, New York City H plus LH, along with hospitals across the country were caught off guard by this pandemic. The lack of preparation meant local 420 members had to work without the proper PPE. At the very beginning, when medical profession, professionals were still learning how to treat this deadly disease. H plus H is the tip of the sword in treating New Yorkers as New York City safety net hospital system and treats the most vulnerable among us. It is a source of pride for local 420 members who are responsible for providing care for our neighbors, friends, and family. To be a local 420 member is to understand the work is often a labor of love. It was that labor of love that carried us through the very worst of COVID-19. In the earliest days of the pandemic, the shortage of PPE meant our members had to take drastic action to protect themselves from this highly contagious disease at a time which was a complete mystery and continues to baffle even the best healthcare professionals. The shortage of N95 masks, surgical masks, gloves and gongs meant my members had to reuse items which are designed for single use. My local had to purchase additional PPE for our members and I must stress it is H plus H responsibility to provide its workers with the supplies they need to get the job done. Some of our members and other healthcare professionals had to suffer the indignity of using garbage bags as makeshift surgical gowns to treat COVID patient um, 19 patients. At one point, the union had to file a grievance against H plus H because our members had to attend to patients with only surgical masks 
because the hospital wanted to reserve N95 for the doctors and nurses. My members are a part of the healthcare team and they should not be treated as second class citizens. It was appalling to hear of such wanton disregard for the lives of local 420 members. It literally signaled to me and my members that our lives were not wor were worth less than those of the doctors and nurses. We quickly put a stop to that action for the rest of the pandemic. All of local 420 members who treat COVID patients receive the same PPE as the healthcare professionals. At the onset of the pandemic, my members were beyond terrified. In addition to the lack of adequate level of PPE, H plus H failed to provide the consistent I'm information expired. of when they could expect. Okay, I'll wrap up. Local 420 leadership spent that time going from hospital to hospital, reassuring our members that they would receive the support and that the city most vulnerable among us will get the care that they need. Our part of the reason that we have lost so many Americans to COVID-19 is because we have been reactive in our response rather than proactive. Prior to the pandemic, we lacked the necessary PPE to protect frontline workers and the general public. As a matter of course, we must work towards stockpiling these materials if there is supposed to be a second wave. Um, in addition to strategic stockpiling, the city should implement a contingency plan for all New Yorkers to socially distance. All New Yorkers should be able to shift to remote work, school and other activities seamlessly, which will help us to stop the spread of future pandemics. In conclusion, I want to thank the chair, Councilman Taylor, I want to thank local 420 members and all New Yorkers essential workers for the great job that they provided during this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to jump in with questions before the uh, next person is uh, brought together. I, I, I want to thank uh, my brothers and sisters at NYSNA and uh, also in particular, Carmen Charles, president of local 420. It was uh, at a meeting with her and her executive board that I really uh, hit home and understood how important this hearing was and, and spurred me to make sure that we reached out to as many of our brothers and sisters as possible. I, I wanna also just thank all the frontline workers who sacrificed their lives to save the lives of others and we can and must do better as a city. Uh, I, I wanna just, uh, I guess, start with uh, President Charles. I'm just sorry for the members you lost it was wrong that your members did not receive PPEs. Uh, your members are not trash. They do not, they should not have been forced to wear garbage bags and they should never have been put in a place where they were attending to patients uh, without N95 masks. Uh, what access does your union, now that you know we have 13.5 million N95 masks in the stockpile, what access is the city giving for you and your members to have access and um, what types of equipment should people who are in H plus H facilities uh, have to N95 and other protective equipment? Um, they, I have no doubt that the hospital, they now have the stockpile of CPE, but again, they are rationing the supplies in that what my members are told, the CDC guideline is not for the titles that local 420 represents. But let me just paint a picture for you. While the doctors and nurses may be in the patient room for a certain amount of time, my members are the ones that's spending the most amount of time in the room because, for example, a housekeeping aide that has to clean the room is not going to clean it in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And so that person is exposed longer to the virus because they are in the room longer. And for them to just be given a surgical mask is an insult. It's an insult and it degrades, it demoralizes the members for the work that they're doing. I had a director of nursing tell me 
Well, your members are not that essential. They're a part of the healthcare team. They are a part of the healthcare team. Right. And every member in the healthcare facility is essential. You are right. Uh, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair. Uh, two quick questions uh, for the Doctors and Nursing Association. You know, I noticed that there is a mask that is available that literally covers the entire face. It's, it's, it's like a, a mask that is used for swimming. It has a cone in the top. It seems to me that that is the most effective and most cost-effective, let me say, um, way of, of going in into a room where potentially they uh, uh, could be exposed to COVID-19. Uh, what are your thoughts on that particular mask? It, it will seem to me that the only part that they just need the N95 cloth is in the top, which is a small piece. I, I, they even sell them in, in, in television. I mean, it, it just seems to me that in infomercials, uh, and as you know, in social media, I mean, they're not hard to get. Uh, any feedback regarding that uh, type of mask? I can answer that. I mean, there's two types of other kinds of reusable materials. One, I think you're talking about the cone one, which is called a PAPR, a purified air, uh, personal air purified respirator. It's uh, expensive. It costs several hundred dollars. It's the best thing. It doesn't harm you at all f physically, and it's very protective. It uses a kind of a little uh, tank to help you. Uh, but the one we're talking about is far cheaper. The Elastomeric only costs between $20 and $40. There's a full face one that covers. All you'd need is a head bonnet. Um, and that's the one we're talking about. It's a lot cheaper because obviously money matters. Um, and it's very, very effective. Uh, it doesn't cause the same abrasions and it certainly is much more effective and it's, and it's reusable. So we're not dealing with the environmental problems uh, or the supply problems. Uh, it would be personally applied to each person and they could, and it fit tests and they use it themselves. It's much safer, it's uh, much better and you can use it. It's designed to be worn for long periods of time. Of course, we love the Pappers, but they're very expensive. Um, and so we're proposing something that's far cheaper cheaper even than using so many N95s, and that would be the elastomeric. They have full face ones as well. So when you approach H&H &H and, and the city, what kind of feedback they are giving you regarding your request for this type of mask? Um, well, in the, you know, each hospital in the, in the private, I work in the private sector and we have appeal to them. Uh, some of the hospitals in the private sector in Brooklyn have agreed, to, and so has my hospital now, uh, and others to use the NIOSH um, pilot. Uh, so we think it's something that the whole the city should adopt because it's cheaper, it's better, and as we said, we could we could actually retool factories and produce them here and provide jobs for people. Fantastic. And my last question was to uh, uh, Donald Nesbitt. Uh, I, as a former uh, sport counselor myself. Uh, working in public schools, uh, I, what's the, the current state of your members? Do, do, are they getting uh, what they're requesting in terms of the PPEs and are they getting uh, enough replacements? So currently at this time, uh, yes, uh, managers have options of ordering. Um, that wasn't the case at the beginning of the pandemic uh, for about, say, three weeks to a month. Uh, we, the union even went out and purchased 40,000 masks for those who were on the front lines uh, because it was taking way too long and our people were being exposed. Um, but right now, I believe they got the message with constant um, communication and, and fighting I'm on our way and we actually told them that we were, weren't going to stop emailing them, weren't going to stop putting the pressure. Um, so I think the DOE has the message now. There's supposed to be a 90 uh, day supply that's in house in every school. Um, so I think now it's much better than it was. But I think if we're talking about a second wave, we need to be ahead of the curve rather than uh, more uh, responsive than um, reactive when things happen. Absolutely. Uh, and please keep us posted as things evolve, uh, if we could be any help and be a, a, 
voice uh, for you. Uh, we want to be there. Thank you so much. Let me turn it back to Chair Kelly. Uh, just I want to follow up with Carmen Charles. During the testimony, I asked whether I asked the administration about whether or not they would provide N95 masks to people who, uh, for whatever reason, felt that they needed one, and they they offered to let people buy them themselves. Is that the right response that we should be hearing from any employer in the city? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My members are some of the lowest paid in H plus H, and they should not be going into their pockets. In fact, the local had to purchase PPE to give to our members, and that's not the role of the union. But in order to alleviate the fear, and you, I don't have to tell you about how fearful people were, you know, and, and so I don't think that the members need to be going into their pockets to buy um, supplies that management, it is management's responsibility to provide it to them. Uh, and let me just, let me just say that, let me just say this, um, Mr. Chair, two nursing homes, long-term care, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney in Brooklyn, I had to go over there twice to deliver supplies to my members and COLA on Roosevelt Island, which I know is part of your um, district. They are the two worst abusers of, of not giving our members PPE. And as folks talk about the uh, racist impact of coronavirus on black and brown communities, what is the makeup, what is the racial demographics of your members? President Charles. Honestly, 99.9% .9 black and brown. Thank you. Uh, if there's, we, we, we've used this hearing as an opportunity to call attention to what you and your members are facing. If there is any more that I or any of my co-chairs can do for you, please do not hesitate and we will be there with you. And um, I guess a, I, I wanna expand it to everybody else, but just across the board for DC 37, NYSNA, uh, for Local 420, it sounds like all of you have purchased PPE for your members. Did any of you get reimbursement from the city? for the money that you purchased for the members? Yeah, right. No. <laughs> no. no. With the mention of that, we'll, we'll, we, send, we'll we send you a seat. I, to, to the extent of, I, I would be interested to see how much you spent and I'd be interested in delivering a, a bill to the city for those amounts. Uh, I, I wanna thank Good. Chair Cabrera for, for uh, the issue with the reusable mask and asking a lot of the questions there. So. Um, President Sheridan Gonzalez, uh, we, we, we brought this up to the administration. They came here perhaps a little bit more ready. They have now said that they are open to it. Uh, you shared that you had a number of locations that you and your members are actually able to get programs going. Uh, they cited issues with fit testing. So I guess, are you prepared to have all of your nurses who will wear these masks fit tested? They cited questions about cleaning. Are you prepared or are your members already trained on how to uh, uh, clean these properly, and they, they cited costs. Uh, how many people, how many N95 masks does a nurse go through in a regular shift uh, versus how many of these would they go through in a shift? Uh, so let me try to remember in order. Um, so we have some nurses. Uh, fortunately for our members, they had some more resources than our brothers and sisters who were in housekeeping in other areas. and. We have members that paid $1,000 of their own money to purchase this exact equipment, uh, not just elastomerics, but Pappers and Tyvek suits and all the things that they needed. And what we did when we recognized that they were so abusive to the housekeeping staff and the other staff, we, we, uh, we rationed equipment so that we could provide the N95s to our staff that was not being given them. So there was an incredible collective response of camaraderie among the workers in helping to take care of each other, uh, those with, who are less fortunate than others. And in addition, we got a lot of donations of a variety of equipment. So um, of course, people are absolutely willing to clean their own equipment. They were doing it anyway to protect themselves. We heard about elastomerics because some of our, our work, we saw the doctors wearing them. They had used faculty funds to buy them. And while we're standing there with these used mucousy N95s. So yes, we know how to clean them. They can be fit tested. They're much easier to be fit tested. There's just two sizes and they're all adjustable. 
So they're easy to be fit tested. They can be fit tested. They can be cleaned. We already have experience doing it. They can last for years. The only thing that have to be replaced are the filters. The filters can be replaced after I think 90 days and they're pretty cheap. So I think I answered all your questions. How many masks does a nurse go through in a shift? I don't know if doctor's counsel is still available if these are still for them too, but how many masks, N95 masks uh, is the protocol for a nurse to go through in a shift versus it sounds like this mask can last 90 days. So I guess what is- No, no, the mask can last for years. It's the filters that just have to be changed. Uh, for every period of time, so, so they're very it's, cheap. It's twenty, thirty dollars for one of these. The last ten years, uh, how many N95s does somebody go through in a day between patients? If you were going to follow the correct protocols, you could go through eight, nine, twelve of them. But right now, people are just going through a few, maybe three or four, if they have the equipment there. But a lot of people are being told, uh, even though they say, "Oh, you can have one whenever you need it," that's not true. Uh, people are intimidated out of, out of out of asking for the appropriate amount. If you're spending a lot of time with a patient with a lot of secretions and you're in a room with that patient, you really have to change it because uh, COVID is not only airborne and droplet, it is also contact. As you know, we're using gel like crazy. So you can get the mass soil. We wear these um, surgical masks over them, but the surgical masks also can slip down. So uh, it, if you were using them properly, you would use many during a day. Very often we're, we're, we're skimping because we're just not sure if we'll have the right equipment. So, so you're testifying today that despite testimony to the contrary, rationing is still occurring? Yes. Thank you. And, and for just for Donald Nesbitt at DC 37, I know you have a large constituency. Uh, I know that uh, local 372 members were, were in, in, in kitchens that are over 100 degrees, uh, cooking meals for thousands, millions of hungry New Yorkers. Um, they were literally up front with people less than six feet away from them, wearing masks, not wearing masks. Uh, what, what type of PPE would you like to see for a, a lunch worker in a kitchen over 100 degrees where it can already be difficult to breathe and there's already issues with that? And then also for a, a worker, uh, it, in, a, in the case of a, perhaps even a shutdown or even SAPIS workers who may be in a confined environment, what kind of equipment do you want for those members who are going to be interacting with members of the public or children who may not be wearing masks and may have coronavirus? Well, we, we would like the most safest uh, masks that can be provided to them. Um, like Sister Charles and I see the Nurses Association, the masks are, even though at some point they, got, they begin to get it right, we're also rationing out what they gave our members. It was like, you get one, and then we're gonna hide the rest, um, and that shouldn't be. Um, I had to pose the question, if it drops off, if it drops on the floor while you're preparing food, the same as if a hairnet or a glove or anything else, we replace it, we use, we, we get a, a different set. So um, it's, it was a whole lot of rationing and a whole lot of fighting, and I hope the city council can do something to ensure that we are um, safe um, the ventilation is issues in our kitchen are certainly there. Um, N95s would be more sufficient. I know they were um, they were harder to get, mm -hmm. so we needed something uh, for our members to be safe. Uh, but we we ask that the most safest mask that the city can provide to them be provided. I know in some schools now with with more. Um, kids and staff coming back and more people in the schools. In some cases, they have given them shields to go over the mask, but the shields, I, I heard a report just this week that I need to um, follow up on, but they gave one mask out for every employee in the kitchen. So there was one, sh one shield for 15 employees. That's just unacceptable. Either you're going to give it or you're not, right? It's that's unacceptable for everyone to be sharing one shield. So those are some of the things that we're actually facing in the school kitchens. Um, and we just hope that the council um, can actually intervene and look into some of these and that a special inspector, inspector can actually make sure that everyone is safe, um, like our brothers and sisters everywhere else. Given the rationing and given doctor's council's testimony uh, regarding concerns about the number uh, I don't know if you have a gut reaction. It took us this many months to find out what the stockpile numbers are. They're talking about 
million N95 masks. They're not willing to share a number on the number of elastomer. I think their number is probably zero at this point. Uh, is 13.5 masks, N95 masks enough? Uh, uh, and then similarly, if you don't have an answer right now because you're right on the spot, would you be willing to come back within 72 hours for the record to let us know what you think the correct number for the stockpile is? Uh, President Sheridan Gonzalez. Oh, I wasn't sure who you were asking that question to. All, um, all of you. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, we have to look at that. I think that, you know, the problem is, is when you have uh, when you have uh, disposable items, you run into shortages and you run into hoarding. I mean, it's unavoidable. Uh, individuals can hoard because they are afraid they won't have one tomorrow. Maybe I'll reuse mine today and save it. I did that in the beginning. I had all these masks drying out on clotheslines, you know, uh, because we just weren't sure we were going to get another one. Uh, so you have you run the risk of 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 hoarding and improper use when you have something that can be reused um, and that you're personally responsible for. Because I think we care mostly about ourselves, protecting ourselves. We have more confidence in our ability to do that than in our employers. I think you do much better. As far as kitchen workers and others who are not in direct contact of patients, I think that they, they're probably, it's, especially if you're in a hot environment, I think that's where ventilation is really important. And then those masks, the other masks, like the lighter ones can be used to protect them. And if they have better ventilation, they're not directly in contact with sick patients, I think they can be protected as well. But ventilation is a big issue that we can't ignore. There are HEPA filters, there's negative pressure ways, uh, there's uh, exhaust ways of getting rid of air in an area, which is why when we're outside, it doesn't affect us as much. I think those things really need to be looked at. In particular, uh, people should not be working in such hot conditions ever, whether there's COVID or not COVID, nobody should be subjected to that kind of a, a temperature to take care of somebody. Couldn't agree more. Take uh, thank, I want to excuse this panel. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for everything that your members have done. Uh, we will continue. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, we will next hear from Charmaine Lathan, followed by Yin Lin, and then Stephen C. Miller. Charmaine Lathan, you may begin when the sergeants call time. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Charmaine Lathan. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the committee. Um, I am a security guard at a homeless shelter located at Holiday Inn MSG on West 29th Street. I started working there right as COVID-19 pandemic was hit in New York City about seven months ago. Um, here to just talk about the conditions me and my colleagues um, had to go through with the PPE for months while watching um, family, friends, coworkers, and shelter residents get sick and even some die. Um, from the COVID, um, knowing that the as as we are essential workers, we had no choice but to continue showing up to work, and we had limited PPE for ourselves. Um, Sometimes, you know, when I get paid, I would spend sixty to eighty dollars out of my check every two weeks to make sure that we had. So I would buy like Lysol wipes and the gloves and masks and things like that to make sure that we had enough um, PPE in order to protect ourselves. Um, as well as try to also make sure that our residents and um, guests that come into the, sh to the, the hotel is, you know, safe and secure. You know, um, our residents and us were one of the issues because a lot of our residents didn't have, you know, so we had to actually have for them as well sometimes, you know, to give them a mask here, some gloves there, you know, things like that. Um, I've been working there now um, eight months and it's, I mean, it's gotten better, but in the beginning, we didn't know what to do. You know, we had masks, we had to, to um, save, they was like, oh, hold that for tomorrow. You got to use that mask tomorrow. I'm like, well, why? You know, don't we have more masks? They're like, oh no, they, they're gone now. We, we don't have any more. I'm like, what? You know, and we just had to, like, we started to worry about whether things were going to get better or worse. Um, during the real height of the pandemic, a lot of people, I seen a lot of, I felt like a lot of people wasn't taking it too seriously. And I was like, you know, this is a serious thing going on. Y'all can't just, you know, take it nonchalant, walking around with no mask. They ask for you to have on a mask. You need to have on a mask, you know? Um, 
now we have masks, but now I'm just concerned because with the height of another pandemic, they saying that might just start to really flare up again, but worse than the first time, it's just the real concern that now we have to start all over with the PPE, not having enough, you know, with us showing up to work every day, being on time, you know, having to buy our own supplies again, it's just a real concern for us. So we're just trying to hope that, you know, we can get help to make sure that we have enough PPE for us and our residents. You know, um, we have the resident, we have a family shelter with the residents and their children. So we try to make sure that them and their children are safe and secure. Um, I had, we had, we had a family that we did that had to quarantine for the 14 days. And, um, you know, we had to still, you know, walk around, but they was like the half of the family was like nonchalant about it. And we was like, no, 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 no. You can't come out your room. You have to quarantine for the full 14 days, you know? And then they started to listen and they actually quarantined and everything got better, you know, but we had to wait for them to come with a doctor's note to be like, okay, everything's good and we okay. But um, it's just a real concern because everybody's concerned now with the possibility of a new height of the pandemic and how would we make sure that we have enough of PPE, gloves, sanitizer, wipes, you know, to make sure that we're sanitizing everything down for each shift, which each shift coming in, you know, to do their job and get their work done, you know. So um, we're just real concerned about that. Thank you, Ms. Latham. Uh, seeing no hands raised from the members, I'm going to move on to the next panelist. Uh, next panelist will be Yin Lin, followed by Dr. Stephen C. Miller, followed by Theo Chino. Uh, Yin Lin, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Cabrera, Kalos, and Malone, and members of the Committees on Governmental Operations, Contracts, and Economic Development. My name is Yin Lin, and I'm a founder and managing partner of Zora Medical. Zorn is a New York City-based medical supply company and distributor of personal protective equipment. Zorn is a minority and women-owned company with an application for certification as such pending with the New York City Department of Small Business Services. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck America in early 2020 and New York City became the epicenter of the pandemic, my partners and I quickly leverage our prior business relationships and personal networks and establish Zorn to bring PPE to frontline workers as soon as possible. Since March of 2020, Zorn has been on the ground cultivating unparalleled supply chain relationships and logistical resources to distinguish Zorn as an expert PPE supply company. Currently, Zorn is operating across the United States in nearly 10 states on both the East and West Coast, as well as the South and Midwest regions. Zorn has supplied over 20 million units of PPE to state governments in partnerships with vendors to the state of Tennessee, state of Maryland, and the state of Georgia, as well as to over 1,000 1, purchasers, both directly and in partnership with trusted vendors. Although Zorn has had success in sourcing PPE for governments in other jurisdictions, the process for supplying government in its home city and state has been more difficult to navigate. For this reason, we commend the committee for their consideration of the legislation that is on today's agenda, proposed intro number 1980-A. Establishing a special inspector within the DOI to review contracts that were entered into in response to the 2019 novel coronavirus and providing for the repeal of such provisions upon the expiration thereof. Despite repeated attempts to demonstrate its PPE product offerings and competitive pricing terms to various government purchasers in New York, Zorn has not been able to supply the New York City government. In fact, it has not been even clear to us what types of PPE the city needs, when and in what quantity. All procurement that the city has done has been on an emergency basis and publication of procurement awards have only listed the vendor and total purchase price. Sometimes these published awards have listed the type of PPE, but never the amount purchased. 
Although some of Zorin's PPE product supplies are produced locally, many are produced overseas. Unlike many of its competitors, Zorn operates on a transparent basis with its customers, fully disclosing its acquisition costs and delivery costs. The market for PPE fluctuates, sometimes very rapidly, based upon supply and demand and the time it takes for a purchaser to close a deal. For these reasons, it is easier and results in greater savings for the purchaser if that is known in advance, instead of trying to procure PPE, PPE on demand. The method that the city uh, has decided to go to seems to utilize the latter, offering very, very little information about what its future needs are. And instead of trying to identify sources of PPE and pricing, which may not be firm for future acquisition. I would also like to point out that Zorn has the financial financing resources to provide the city's terms to enable payment upon inspection of the product, which will allow the city to mitigate supply chain risks. Despite these challenges, Zorn has been able to su successfully supply leading New York City nonprofits, including AHRC, Public Health Solutions, the Transit Workers Union, and our own COVID-19 task force. Today, Zorn is a direct distributor for US-based manufacturer PPE. Most recently, New York State's very own Shack and First, which specializes in the N95 masks. We will be making a 50,000 mask donation to Long Island Cares with the Shack and First N95 mask next week. Additionally, Zorn is a direct distributor for N95 mask factory in California and Florida, as well as a surgical three-ply mask manufacturer in upstate New York. As one of the few New York City-based NWBE PPE suppliers, Zorn remains ready to meet NYC's procurement needs by providing superior products at competitive costs. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Council Member Kalos here. So you heard the city talk about the fact that they only hit their 14% goal instead of 30% goal. Uh, I'm personally familiar with some of the challenges you were dealing with, but what, what does the city need to, from everything you justified, you're doing business with some pretty major players, other states. What is New York City doing wrong that I think you said Georgia is doing right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of uh, allowing those opportunities to be made available to all MWB and um, being transparent about what are their needs in advance so that we can prepare for them. Um, so, so as not to buy on demand, which is the worst method of, of buying PPE. Thank you. Uh, and, and so if there was, if, if we had a magic wand, there was one thing we could do to, to increase access for MWBEs to the PPE procurement, what would it be? I think it's to uh, open up a portal whereby MWBEs are accessing these contracts in advance of other um, contractors, especially since we are far below the, the quota that we aim to be at as a city of 30%, if we provide those opportunities first to MWBE, that would enable them to um, fulfill those contracts and be able to fulfill the needs of the city. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Yin Lin. Next, we will hear from Dr. Stephen C. Stephen C. Miller, followed by uh, Theo Chino. Uh, as a reminder to anybody who wishes to testify who has not been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called upon in the order that you raise your hand. Mr. D Dr. Miller, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. And thank you so much to the city council for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, my name is uh, Steve Miller. I'm um, a, um, a fellow in pulmonary and critical care at Brooklyn Hospital Center. Um, in the spring when the pandemic hit, I was the house staff president and uh, delegate for the uh, committee of interns and residents. It's a union that represents 17,000 um, house staff uh, across the nation. It's the largest house staff union uh, in the country. And um, in the spring, uh, the winter and the spring of uh, 2020, as I'm sure you're aware, we basically worked through a living nightmare every day uh, people came to our door um, sick and dying, and uh, we had to uh, wade through the masses of sick and dying people without the adequate protection uh, that our staff needed. Um, you know, to, to, to speak to President Charles's statement about wearing trash bags, I saw nurses 
uh, wearing trash bags over their heads uh, because they didn't have adequate respiratory protection to go into rooms with COVID patients. And uh, it's clear actually from listening to um, the statements that were made uh, uh, during this, uh, this, this meeting, uh, the testimony is about the, uh, the levels of PPE that the city's planning to procure, that there are still plans to ration PPE uh, for patient encounters uh, because uh, even 3.5 or even 13.5 million N95s wouldn't be adequate to, to use as an individual use, uh, single use uh, case for this PPE. And if you're talking about holding 167 million pairs of nitrile gloves, but only 13.5 million masks, then you can see right there that you're anticipating that, although uh, you would not want me to wear a pair of gloves for multiple patient encounters, that you would expect that I could wear an N95 uh, the same way. So when uh, this was starting to, to come across the globe back in January and February, I was paying pretty keen attention to what was going on in other countries, China and Spain and Italy. And I saw videos of how uh, Chinese hospitals were managing their COVID patients and they were all wearing PAPRs, those powered air purifying respirators or reusables like elastomerics. And they were covered head to toe. Absolutely everybody was covered. And they were meticulous in their use of their PPE and had donning and doffing stations. And, and they have all these resources, a lot of the resources that we rely upon for our hospitals are made in Wuhan, China. Actually, most of our masks and all of our equipment are made there. So they have access, so I can understand that. Um, but when they got sick, they shut down the production and the rest of the world felt that. And it was uh, just weeks later that I noticed that Spain and Italy had run out of masks and they were seeing patients without them. Uh, because you can't just decide to stop treating people because you don't have the necessary equipment to protect yourself. So they had doctors and nurses and, uh, and techs and people who cleaned hospitals. They're just dying from uh, COVID because they couldn't be protected. And I knew that that was a situation that was going to be visiting the U.S. in short order. Um, so I went online, actually, and bought myself a reusable elastomeric. I got myself a full face mask um, because I recognized that this virus is tiny. You get in through your eyes and uh, that is a respiratory pandemic. So respiratory protection would be paramount. Um, so I ordered a mask on Amazon, actually. I got it at the end of February and I started using it right away. Since February, I've worked uh, 25 days out of the month, every single month, 10 to 14 hours a day. And uh, I've not used a single N95 in that entire period. Um, I recognized very early that uh, to be reusing these green N95s was a, a silly proposition. They're not built for that. They're meant to be used for 10 or 15 minutes at a time and disposed of immediately. The thought of taking one from one patient room to another is something that had never ever been contemplated before in a hospital system. But we usually use those masks for tuberculosis patients and, uh, and they're not really given out freely in other cases. So the idea that you would leave a room of somebody who had tuberculosis and then walk around the hospital with that same mask, which potentially trapped a bunch of tuberculosis on it, you could possibly be spreading that through the hospital. Uh, nobody would ever stand for that. Um, but yet with COVID, that was what we were asking people to do. Um, so as long as we were gonna be reusing PPE, I realized we needed to have reusable PPE. So I started a campaign to outfit everybody in my hospital with an elastomeric mask. Time expired. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my time is over. If you don't mind, I'd like to continue. Um, um, we got uh, masks for all 273 residents and fellows um, using some funds that I was able to get from the hospital. And I also worked with a bunch of local organizations to try and get masks for everybody who worked in the hospital, including all the nurses, techs, the house staff, everybody who worked here. And uh, so far we've, we've got 600 masks to cover the 2,700 people who work in our hospital. There's a thousand clinical staff and we're working to get another 400 now. Um, but once you uh, have one of these masks, you don't need to wear an N95 anymore. And that's gotta be saving a huge amount of money. Um, if you just figure there's 62 hospitals in New York City and about 500 clinical staff work each day. And if each one of them sees 10 patients and there's 30 days in a month, that's 9 million masks every single month that you would have to be accounting for. 
So there's no way that 13.5 million masks is going to cover you guys for 90 days. It's just not going to work. That math doesn't work. But with one of these masks, and I have uh, Mr. Cabrera had mentioned, I don't know if you can see that, these are uh, reusable face masks. They come with the filters on top. And I spoke with 3M on the phone during the peak of the pandemic because nobody had any guidance about how to use these in such a uh, use case. They weren't really ever designed for that. But they just told me that if you have five sets of filters and you just use one each day in five day rotation, you never need to dispose of them ever. They can be used indefinitely. All you have to do is have five of these, five sets of these and one mask and you can be covered forever. And all you do is you take off this, you know, set it aside for five days, put on the next set, set that one aside the next day, you just keep rotating in a five day series and you will never need to replace these. Um, and so uh, that's how I've gotten through the pandemic and I've had uh, success getting other people through the same way. Um, the cost for one of these masks is a little bit more, it's about 200 bucks for a mask. Um, but the ones that we've been fitting our staff with are these half masks, and these are about 30 bucks a piece. And uh, $30, $35 per person um, will get you respiratory protection for the next three years, which may be how long this pandemic lasts for. We don't even know. Even once people have uh, antibodies, we're still seeing people are getting reinfected. So we don't thank know. You. And how do you wipe the outside of that mask after you come into contact with the patient? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So while I had opportunities uh, uh, to, to, to gather some props uh, for my presentation while you guys were talking today. So this is a chlorhexidine alcohol wipe. It's a pretty simple device. Um, I don't think there's about a thousand of them in one of these boxes. And we use these to clean everything in the hospital. And so basically what you do is if you're wearing the mask, you just have a pair of clean gloves on, take out one of these and you just wipe it. That's it. It's really simple. You can wipe the whole mask. The only thing you can't wipe is the filtration surface. This little pad in here, that's what's catching all the virus. You don't want to get that wet. But otherwise, you use this to clean everything else, and you just leave that alone. And then you just hang it up. You and can wear you it all day long. And filter once every 90 days. No, the filters last forever. OK. You just need five sets. And so what you do is on day one of, of the week, you use this one, then you set it aside for day two, you put it on a new one, set that one aside, day three, you put a new one on day four, a new one, day so five, a new one. Just the filters. And then you go back to the first one you use the first day of the week and you put that one back on and you just use it in five day rotations over and over and over again. 3M says they never need to be discarded. They, they, they can't be used up in this case. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, our last panelist uh, will be Theo Chino. Again, a little reminder to everybody else who may still be interested in testifying. If you have not heard your name called and you wish to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, Mr. Chino, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Time starts now. Hello, yes, uh, Councilman Carlos. Uh, can I get my camera on, please? Yes. So I can... Thank you. Wonderful. Sergeant in arm, I mean, uh, I'm trying to get my camera on. Will the sergeants please turn on uh, Mr. Chino's camera? Thank you, how you doing? Uh, I'm going to be quick. I feel this bill is wonderful in practice, but it's one more band-aid that New York City is adding to its repertoire of useless bill, which, which, which include technology. We're, we heard the DOI, I mean, um, when it comes to contracting, billions and billions of dollars are misappropriated for one reason or another. The, the, here, the, the portion is about to talk about the technological part of the bill. First of all, we have a commission on public information and communication. That is run by Jumani William. That's his job to deal with this kind of thing in a way to look at where the, that the technology and the use of the technology and the public information that goes into those database is managed. So why do we need to have a bill given to the DOI? The second part is the DOI has been, as you know, I've been going committee to committee to complain about the lack of oversight within the HPD housing market stock. So if we cannot figure out how to deal with simple things that are buildings 
grounded in the earth and figure out which building are misappropriated, how are we going to do with contract? The DOI cannot figure out if a building is legally owned by a certain entity. Now you're talking about a piece of paper with a signature that will disappear and we'll never know. So I feel that this bill, this kind of bill where we say we need to build a database, we need to give it to an entity, we need to give it to people who are not even trained to do that job because computer engineer and people who deal with that, there are 0.3% of the population who deal with that. That means out of 3 billion active local force, working force, only 9 million around the world are able to program database. That means New York doesn't have the staff to deal with that. So I feel that we need to look at all these kind of bills in a different way to make sure the population of New York is served correctly and try to stop to adding technological stopgap into fixing problem of information. The thing is we need transparency. That transparency needs to be given to the DOITT. The thing is the DOITT needs to give it to the, to the, to the Commission of Public Information to make sure it follow ethical guidelines and then the public can deal with it. And people like, like union people who say, oh, we have a problem, they can go get that data and analyze it faster than anyone can do it. So why to give to an agency that is the DOI who is incapable of, of figuring out billions of dollars within the HPD, uh, the HPD, the housing problem, why are we giving them more work to do that they are incapable of doing? So let's fix this thing in a decent way. Let's start looking at things from the ground up. And I know, uh, Councilman Kalos, you are very good technologically. So let's do that. Let's start looking at this thing outside the box. I know we're capable of doing that. And uh, I yield the time of uh, the remainder of my time because if you have any question, any suggestion or anything, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chino. I'll now turn it back to Chair Kalos. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chino, for your testimony. As, as you saw, I asked specific questions relating to que uh, concerns that were brought up at First Friday uh, of the commissioner, and we do have a path forward. I want to thank our committee staff. I want to thank my uh, co-chairs. I want to thank uh, everybody involved today, uh, everyone who waited quite a long time. This has been quite a long hearing, uh, just under six hours. Uh, for everything uh, that we still have a lot of work to do, we need to make sure these PPE numbers for the stockpiles are correct. And uh, together we will make sure that we get through a second wave if, one, if and when one comes uh, in a way that everyone has the protective equipment they need and there's no unnecessary loss of life. So I wanna thank everyone. Uh, Chair Malone, do you wanna jump in on anything? Just thank you, Chair Kalos, and to everyone who stayed through, these hearings are so important. So God bless everyone, and any follow-up questions or concerns, just email any of the chairs, and we will get back to you. Thank you. If you haven't already submitted testimony, you have 72 hours to do so. Uh, we hereby end this committee hearing, and uh, thank you.